All righty then, gamers. Arc World Tour 2023 finished last night. Hope you all, uh, gamists at home, had fun watching that. It's going to be a fairly tightly packed couple of months uh, now since we got uh, we got Abba coming uh, coming out next week, which uh, of course will be able to be picked for next Sunday's Bounty Hunters if that's in your uh, schedule. But then also allegedly uh, Slayer got teased already for was it May around May, uh, and then of course we should probably have some balance changes on the horizon as well. Lots of new things gonna be happening in the world of Guilty Gear Strive uh, for the coming months. But let's let's talk business here. So we're approaching the 5 p.m. CET mark again on this fine Sunday evening, and that means that Weekly Bounty Hunters FT7 is a couple of minutes short from kicking off. Uh, if it's your first time with us, we are basically a weekly 1st to 7 show match event happening every Sunday for uh, players of all skill levels and regions, that is. And the name of the game is, of course, Guilty Gear Strive. I am your usual host, QK, and I'll be taking you through the action tonight in our seven matches. So let's do a quick preview for what's in store for tonight. <clears throat> I think half of our card, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, but pretty much half of our card is uh, players who are making their debut matches tonight. Players who I haven't really seen playing before, but as per usual, uh, you know, a lot of the players are of the strong caliber, so even if you're seeing these players play for the first time, or maybe I'm reflecting, even if I am seeing these players play for the first time, uh, a lot of them are certified, uh, certified gamists. So the new players uh, in the second uh, time slot, we got Eden, who was meant to play their first match last week, but we had a slightly unfortunate circumstances with uh, connections. So this time our Albanian Kai hero gonna be rocking it against Zokhiz. Then on the third matchup slot, we got Swear Fox uh, and Chainsaw Angel, two first timers on Bounty Hunters. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. Dear me, my voice already. <coughs> Basically in a, in a, uh, whatchamacallit, Valentine matchup. Ram, of course, the character who's been there from the beginning of Strive and then the newest Valentine edition, Elfeld. I'm super, super interested to see how that goes. We don't have a lot of Rams. Ram is like one of the rarer characters in Bounty Hunters, uh, along with Milia, I think. And the further along the patches we've gone, the more rare the character has become as well. I think we saw the most representation at the start, uh, but it has slowly dwindled. It is very interesting case with Ramethal Valentine. It's kind of like a... I hear a lot about, you know, Ram being the strongest character in the game that just is not represented and is not winning a lot of stuff. So there's that. Uh, then Rockless Machamai, we've got two, uh, well, not first comers, uh, we got pretty much uh, part of the uh, part of the kit of Bounty Hunters at this point already. But then in the next one, Mellow Rage, uh, one of the other newcomers, Anji Player, uh, let's see, Mellow Rain, Rage uh, representing the United Kingdom colors. Then on the second last sixth matchup slot, we got Day Dynamic. Day, I think, was talking about how uh, they wanted to play against Rygand May anyway, very soon in a mirror match. Had some uh, some amount of mm, plans to challenge Rygand to a match. So I mean, it kind of just happened like this. We we might as well do it on Bounty Hunters. I didn't mean it to happen. Mean, mean it to happen, but you know, it's. Uh, the roster just rolled out like this this time. It's gonna be super interesting. Two explosive May players. Where when when May is on screen, it's always gonna be explosive. Let's uh, let's not kid ourselves. So that should be a super action-packed match. And I'm finishing the evening off with another pair of newcomers. So Nana Komatsu, 
uh, Zato player, Cloud, a Johnny player. Good to see some Johnny representation as well. Uh, been on the down low with that since a uh, couple of the first weeks after the release of Johnny. I think the community at the moment like tends to think of Johnny as a, you know, basically the same. It's the it's the DLC release case. Um, same it's been for pretty much every single DLC character so far, except for maybe Happy Chaos and Asuka. It's uh, generally Arc System Works releases characters rather undertuned rather than overtuned, especially since the <laughs> since the Happy Chaos incident. So I think uh, Johnny has been in the eyes of the community still in that kind of position where. Perhaps you still need some fine-tuning, and perhaps that might be a deterrent for players uh, picking him up. But probably gonna receive some love in the upcoming patches, and you know, still still cool character, has a lot of nasty stuff already, so with a couple of perhaps uh, adjustments or uh, quality of life things, it's the it, same goes for Johnny and... and Elfo as well. Those two characters, the newest DLC characters, have a lot of really nasty junk. So, if a little bit extra gets added to their kit, uh, they're probably gonna be up there with uh, with the best of them very soon. But let's see. Let's, however, uh, what do we do? This. Let's circle back to the first matchup, which we is gonna be Dora versus Shibo. I think this is, uh, <laughs> Shibo's probably at this moment the most unlucky player of Bounty Hunter's history, at least uh, of the current season players. Probably three or four of their games have been cancelled due to some sort of unforeseen circumstances, but hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll get another match for Shibo uh, tonight. Actually, bring the ping the players already because we are kind of getting near the 5 p.m. CET mark. Players have been pinged. I think we got both our competitors in the lobby as well already. So now all that is left is to talk some smack and wait until the players have prepared their hearts for the upcoming spectacle. It is kind of a spectacle to be playing in a, you know, in a public events like this. It's kind of like appearing on a double elimination bracket on stream. It can be extremely uh, exciting, threatening, anxiety-inducing, make your hands shake, all of those things. Uh, but it gets better a long time when you know you get more experience in a in a field of combat like this, especially for like players who are not as um, what you call it are not a long time fighting game players already and have not been putting themselves out there in the grand competitions yet. So Dora, I think we, we've seen Dora on quite a couple different characters. I think the most, most uh, recent for Dora was, I think he played, yeah, played Bridget re uh, previously as well against Emu. Uh, I think the plan was to play Geo initially, but then I think it struck uh, struck Dora, and he wanted to play uh, Bridget again instead. I think Shibo is already uh, okay with that switcherino as well. Shibo has pretty much played, as far as I can remember, Axel throughout all of their ma matches on Bounty Hunters. This will be an interesting character pairing. We have two uh, characters capable of fighting from very far away. Axel, of course, pretty much the if there was a zoner archetype for an aggressive game such as Guilty Gear franchise, I think Axel is as as close to a zoner that you can get. 
On the other hand, Bridget is not too far behind in that regard. She also fights from pretty much half screen away, can keep opponents away, has a pretty good fi uh, fireball. Although a fireball that is uh, more oriented towards set play. So it's, it's a great fireball to send out as an, you know, as an aggressive move when it has a... So basically you can send it out two different ways. Either make it so that it hits on the way in or on the way out. Uh, and technically it goes on a small cooldown until it comes back. So if Bridget could just fire her yo-yo continuously all the time, I think it would be a, like one of the strongest fireballs in the game perhaps. But of course, because it you know goes on a cooldown of sorts and contributes more to her set play, it's a... Uh, it's a little harder tool to evaluate in that sense. And speaking of the pressure... Ooh, trades on that Whistling Winds! Of course, the Whistling Winds, if you get the fully charged stack as Axel, it's gonna give quite a bit of plus frames to you. So Axel's new move has, uh, has multi... It's basically multi-functional. You can kind of use it as a, as a quick call out anti-air against instant air dashes but then there's also the charge rps on on pressure whether you let it rip immediately which could make it a frame trap or if you charge it fully which could make it a pressure reset instead with the boss frames nice jump forward there from the wrong start already set up the yo-yo find a hit and this is how bridget will flow Ooh, gets matched by 2k though Axel's best and Ooh, there we go! Fully charged, it has an anti-air as well. That works too. 50 meter, ready to go for both players. Bridget, of course, known for her ability to sort of skip from half screen to the- Oh! Wait, the close slash goes the wrong way! So <laughs> but the reversal super from Axel also very slow here. So both players uh, sort of escaping with a little bit of an oopsie. 2S from Axel, hits home, decent a big combo, Whistling Winds is there, holding Bridget down in the air. If you can put your opponent in a position like that, that is, that is that's ought to cause them quite a bit of risk build up. As uh, in Guild Gear Strive, when you pluck anything in the air without FD, it's gonna have that extra little bit of a modifier for, you know, cranking their risk gauge. I mean, it's not like you're gonna do anything in that position anyway, other than, you know, just take take stuff from Axel. But then on the other hand, as well, it's not like Axel can really mix you up while you are up in there. You'll kind of have to wait till the opponent drops on the ground. Very nice instant air dash again. It's gonna be one of the most common approach tools against, uh, against Axel low. He's pretty much the strongest when it comes to like range and getting the first say in a round. That's gonna be minus. Though I didn't completely commit to the dash in. And I wonder, I wonder what Bridget's options are when you block, uh, when you block Snail on the ground. It's very, very minus kind of a pressure ender. But on the other hand, it also pushes the opponent away so far away that it's it can be hard to reach Axel and get a, any sort of relevant punish. I think the super is gonna call out the kickstart break. And put Shibo in one point each situation. Both players starting starting with the game. Yeah, there's the snail again. Once again. Dora not what, not quite uh, comfortable enough attempting the punish and or even pressing the situation after that. I mean, it's understandable if you feel like you weren't very early to reacting to what's happening. It can be easy to just dash in and get tagged by Axel's buttons anyway, if you're not careful. Again, the kickstart break! That's usually when you space it properly is gonna be safe and or plus. But Shibo recover, uh, answering that sequence with a uh, with a reversal super twice in a row now. Right, keeping up the pre uh, rather the, the zoning with one move though, and you could potentially, as Axel player, be in a situation where Bridget 
gets to challenge you with a swing of her own. Remember, a lot of Axel's stuff is actually very minus at full screen. The the kicker or the the basically how he keeps on playing the neutral for a long time is a lot of characters just don't have a way to challenge you even if you are minus. So say you're like minus 10 at full screen. What is your opponent gonna do unless they are like Axel Low themselves? Right, probably gonna get a disconnect here. Perhaps a little too eager to press the retry button too fast, which is one of the curses that we are still working with as TOs when it comes to hosting events. Let's do some quick lobby magic and hopefully get players back to the room. Wait, was it? It was Dora who took the round, right? Howdy, gamers. Welcome, welcome. It's a little bit of a... A little bit of a, um, whatchamacallit, a break here between the games. Of course, to refresh your memory how we usually deal with situations like this, uh, we don't exactly know what causes the spectators to drop from the games, but we are suspecting that it's uh, has to do with, you know, the state which the spectators are at the moment so the spectators are usually like, like a little behind from the players so if you press retry too fast it's probably gonna like desync the play state and the spectators which is i think what we think at the moment is causing the uh disconnects and in the uh in the name of the competitive uh cohesion we usually don't you know once the players already start their games, they they can they can play them, uh, and we'll we'll count the score. But we do recommend players, uh, whenever you play on bounty hunters, uh, be patient, press the retry button gently, slowly, take a breather. There's uh, there's always time. Flip it back to a rematch. Yeah, that's actually what I was uh, wondering about. I might have put point on the wrong player earlier, so... Or was it forward to Axel? Wait, did I, <laughs> did I mess up that bad? 4 I mean the players players know players know better. That's uh that's an interesting double blunder there, huh? Alright, but we have been corrected and the score is supposedly right at the moment, so that would mean Shivo is up 4-0. Right, back into it. We got the pressure in the corner. Shivo. Now wanted to take the uh the ebb and flow of Ooh! Got by the 2D there. Back into the mid jump. D scores a hit. This should be a wall break. Perhaps missing the super there for the heart knockdown. We're still with a lot of Ooh! Very nice angle there! Tried to the 2k out of the kickstart immediately. But Shivo had already recovered and got to throw out a reversal super there. A nice snipe there. Jump slash catching Dora on the way down. Sent the yo-yo, but a lot of projectiles like that are going to be recovered until landing. And that jump slash from Axel can reach almost half screen away. There we go, finding a hard knockdown into close slash. Are we gonna get the super? Yeah, this time and choosing choosing the rocket super in case that the uh, the reversal one is gonna win from that range. D landing a slight unclean hit. It's in the burst as a momentum mechanism to keep Shivo in the corner. All players are very loaded with meter. 
special next hit should definitely have the explosive capabilities to bring the round to an end there with a clean and simple RC. Shivo takes another one. I think the earlier earlier rounds were slightly more even, but like like said, Shivo has been sort of doubling it up and has been dominating the the later games. Get a straight hit from Kickstart straight into Rock the Baby. It's like Dora has been landing these hits pretty consistently. It's oh, it's gonna reach. No, this is exactly what Dora was worrying up worrying about the previous. Uh, war break sequence chose to break with Roger Super instead because it's very limited range there. What you can do with the other Super, the close slash, and due to that massive hit stop, was able to block as well. So if Dora manages to take the round here, does indeed do so, and now going into the next round with a massive advantage here, Shibo has no burst in the gauge whatsoever. Assuming a far range position. They are slowly trying to work their way in. There we go with the jump in. Time to mix it up. Bridget, of course, with a decently fully corner carrying combo. Is this a safe jump? No, not quite. Still takes a super on the landing. Follow up of Branson also pulling Dora out of the sky and the very common instant air dash or back jump, jump slash. The go-to tool for Axel players for when you want to protect your airspace, or rather, pretty much all space in front of you. The downside of that maneuver is that it does give away space a bit. So if the opponent is dashing forward, they do get to procure a little bit of that real estate, which you are giving away. However, it doesn't matter too much if you don't get hit, though. Oh, speaking of getting hit, jump D in the air, very uh, not typical hit, I would. Uh, I would say. Go oh, RC, keep it steady. Shivo immediately goes to the YRC. And get into command grab. Big value there. Switching sides with that Axel full screen command grab. With the jumps. Any anti airs? No, just getting out of the corner. Nice! But unfortunately, trading out of the kickstart, I was actually, I initially thought that Dora had a pretty good kickstart again there and would have been able to, you know, trade favorably. But alas, Dora's life already too low. Place 2S as an anti air. She will get out of the corner with that air dash. Not too, like, not, not for free. Took a little bit of a hit there, as well as pressure sequence. S anti airs working very well for Shivo. I mean, if, if there's one character who you want to be really on point with anti airs, it would have to be Axel Low, because characters who basically revolve around playing neutral and nothing else, such as Axel, uh, you know, if you don't have anti airs, you can't force the opponent to play neutral with you, right? They would just always, every single time, jump in and. You couldn't, you couldn't play your zoning, you couldn't play your footsies at all. And on the other hand, Axel is, you know... There are very few characters who can contest what Axel does on the ground. So even, you know, long-range-ish characters like Bridget's are, uh, you know, Bridget or... You know, what's another good example? Sin is a pretty decent one. Characters like that would love to work their way in, but now... Gets the burst off. Oh no! The Kickstar actually initially looked like it was gonna evade the command grab, but then landing right in front of Shibo, where the incoming, you know, projectile type crab was gonna land. So that would end it in Shibo's favor. 7 0. A quick sweep, but understandable. I think Dora is a little bit newer with Bridget. So there is still stuff to work on and we can come back stronger next time. It's basically what we always tell each uh, tell ourselves after uh, after a tough loss. 
But next up, we're gonna double up the pace going into advanced skill bracket right off the get-go. Zokhiz versus Eden. Now, one of the finest OG fighters from Finland is gonna face a newcomer on Bounty Hunters. Eden was meant to play previous week, but uh, we had some connection issues and you know, Eden's match had to be cancelled. As far as I understood, it's still a rather, you know, rough connection from Finland to Albania, but the players deemed it playable. So we're gonna see how this is gonna pan out today. Also, yeah, happy birthday, Zokis. I think uh, Zokis' birthday was uh, yesterday, right? So the birthday boy is gonna ride into battle with Leo Whitefang. Zokis, of course, another player with a lot of different characters under their belt. Started with Potemkin, went with Nago for a while, and now currently, you know, pretty much capable of handling both Leo and Nago on a relatively high level. Uh, let me fix the names as well. Alright, and we are ready to rock here. Right of the King with massive active frames. Making Eden's anti-air with that. I think Eden went for a 5B, which recovered extremely fast. On well, time for those anti-air situations. You are looking for active frames. Come, electricity is on. We go in with the red wild assault. Found the, found the frame trap and a massive combo as well. I think Kai Kiss, one of the characters who you wouldn't think a damage character, especially on Season 1 and Season 2, but oh boy, come Season 3, you have not only the massive corner damage that Kai has pretty much always had from his heavy buttons, but now combined with the Red Wild Assault, he can actually get into that, you know, massive damage from surprisingly far away. And I think from counter hits as well, Kai is one of those characters who can go for the fully charged uh, Red Wild Assault conversions, which further increases his damage. Oh, but there we go. Speaking of massive counter hit, which Zok is immediately smartly bursted. That would have probably been... <laughs> I'm not going to be honest. Zok is might have actually died there. Into that situation again. Here we go. That's so smart. Sees the heavy fireball Oki, which technically is not safe against any sort of reversal. So it's kind of like a reaction test on the opponent. Do you have a DP meterless, or are you ready to, you know, turn up your reversal super? And Leo's reversal super is gonna move himself. Uh, is gonna move Leo forward quite a bit. So no way you can space that heavy fireball Oki as a as a Kai safely. As meter. But a very early wall break here, forcing Zokis to break on a soft knockdown. Nice hard reading into the 6P. Was that a hard read? Was that a reaction? That was very, very fast 6P. Perhaps I want to say that would be quite of a game of reaction if that was uh, on, a, on a reaction to the flip kick. I might have been looking for, for example, you know, far slash. Any standing pokes for Kai. You know, 6Ps are fairly strong as a, as Futsi tools on Guilty Gear Strive, so, you know. Not the strangest of uh, maneuvers. As Barry stands timing. Guarantee Sok is some really nice pressure here, especially since Eden doesn't have a lot of resources. Not even 50% yet on the tension front. Just a quick tap on the noggin with that 5B. Plus on block. And leads into some good uh, stagger pressure or frame traps. And burst save as well, as uh, far as I can remember. Might even be, is, is Leo's 5B actually DP save? That might actually be, because uh, Kai is one of those slower DP characters. So the 5B, it's a quick jab into block, might be burst save. But speaking of burst saves, Zoki's on their last pixel. Is Zoki gonna actually rob this? Gonna have a super here, hard knockdown, but look at these resources. Eden technically has everything available. 75 meter and full burst. Gets to play the meaty cross up though. Lots of blast frames from that flip kick on the electricity. E electricity though. Ex excuse me, my pronunciation. Oh, but again, Zokis likes that parry stance tool quite a bit. And not scared of testing the opponent's uh, 
ability to play against it as well. There is quite a bit of... Oh, well, that thought we got a big counter hit here. Six heavy into the corner. Yeah, Zokis knew that was going to be a wall break as well as almost all of Zokis' remaining life. Still in the top spot. The risk is slowly cranking. Zokis making... What, doing their best to negate as much of that risk as possible was holding FD for a very long time, but that cost Zokis quite a bit of meter. And Eden, even from that pressure sequence... Oh, hello, where are we comboing? Side swap. Into the corner, 5k OTG, that's cancel, we getting in there. As per usual, both players opening it up one game apiece. Looking out to be quite a, quite an interesting match here. Lots of back and forth. Some robberies, early robberies. And lots of fundamentals and footsies, which is what yours truly basically thrives on. I love myself really a good footsie matchup. And with these two characters, even though Leo White had, ooh, went for a very, very hard call out frame trap, I think, with that DP there, or perhaps a misinput on Fireball. I guess we'll never know. Get the wall, Zokis, with really good resources. The 5 game from Kai from Roundstar, preventing Zokis from playing the very common Micro Dash 2K Roundstar sequence that Leo players love to do. Leo, because Leo has the step dash, uh, he's just like Giovanna, has pretty good access to dashing normals. Uh, so like Dash 2K is one of the one of the ever evergreen classics for you know, the kind of moves that you can play. Oh, hard bait here. Zokis doesn't really get into the position where they get to. I, I guess could have flash kick RC'd there if they, you know, really wanted to play that. With one, two. Another one. 60% of health gone from Eden. Zokis immediately re uh, re answering with the first. Doesn't want to get contained in the corner. Nice shimmy there. The micro walk forward and back into a back turn S. Now, this is Putsis. Yes, indeed. Ever since the ancient times, the back turn has very nice range, very nice disjoints, but with inherent risk that once Leo goes into that back turn stance, you can't block. And neither did Eden here when Zokis went for that reversal super. Kind of safe, you did have your 50 meters, so if it whips, if it's blocked, Zokis had the, uh, had the necessary juice to make it safe as well. So why should you not? Another thing is that Leo works. Oh, that was from so far away. Zokis with the full combo, setting up the cross up, but Eden not faced, not ready to, or rather, not uh, getting tricked by that <laughs> dash through. Zokis again, releasing the super, using the full stick of butter to be safe and then set up a pressure situation. Again, why should you not? If your opponent is basically one pressure sequence away from dying, you should grasp the initiative. You should use everything that you have at your disposal. Better than dying a Garfield. Better than leaving those uh, ever so important resources unused. Of course, if your opponent perseveres and then you spend all of your 100 meter and then have to pressure them, you... <laughs> Obviously, you're not gonna have those resources anymore for your pressure. So that is, uh, that is sort of the risk that you take. Counter hit, the 2k doesn't quite reach there. Both players placing a lot of buttons from that brawling se se sequence. Let's see, Zoki's early super might actually be a kill. No, it actually doesn't wall break either. Big Gamba here, Eden. As the oh, big carry! That was exactly what Eden was looking for. Like I said, took a slightly large mid-size-ish gamble there, bursting Zonkis into the corner with basically zero life to spend, but found exactly what he was looking for, the counter hit. Six heavy. Here we go, now with the spacing where Zokis couldn't release the flash kick. If he had the super there, could have uh, gone through that heavy fireball, Oki. Big throw, RC, Zokis will have to find a burst timing here, does so. But this is a tough situation, Eden has a massive life advantage. Oh, dashing into the corner, I think Eden was trying to do a back air dash there, but ended up turning into a forward air dash. Because of uh, Zokis' is, uh, momentary cross up there, two points even.
Right, keeps developing. A player swinging a miss. Very common round start option for a lot of characters from uh, uh, in Guild of Gears Try. Take a take a micro step back and wait for your opponent to press their button immediately. Speaking of press, <laughs> speaking of uh, waiting for your opponent pressing a button there, Zock is getting a nice back turn D into super. Ooh, this is this is a hero burst. Yeah, it's uh. <laughs> Even more ambitious than the previous one, but that time Zok is at almost full life bar and quite a bit of resources to spend as well. So now Eden is gonna pay for that daring burst, taking a big counter hit from that back turn heavy. Zok is look at that! From what distance? That is exactly what I was talking about earlier when we were, uh, you know, taking a gander at that back turn S. Wow, try to take a... Tried to take a stun dipper there. However, Zokis is far slash still active. Or was that five heavy? Those moves are a little hard to uh, differentiate from each other. But able to tack the startup of stun dipper there with a counter hit, no less. I tried to go for a very daring flash kick S version there. Over Eden. Assuming a more... Ooh! Look at that! The back back jump jump heavy! Nice! The red RC producing an extra strike, which ends up knocking Zokis out of that parry stance. It's very interesting RPS, because technically you could parry stance the RC explosion as well if you are hoarding, holding your stance, but the more usual sequence is as soon as you see the opponent unleash a strike on you, you let your stance go and unleash your own strike as well. Which if you do, then you would technically give away your, uh, your parry frames or your guard point frames or whatever you technically want to call them. Very aggressive dash right from the get-go. Electricity has been applied, however, Zokis pounces from half screen away. The setup, the dash through, not plus enough though, getting crabbed. However, Zokis has procured back the aggressive position, has the super here as well. Quite gonna be the kill, but will put Zokis in a primary mauling position still. This is exactly the position you want to maintain when you are Leo White and RC looking for the burst potentially. Eden though, not ready to give it away. Very smart this time around, even though, you know, I, I think I love adjustments like these. Sometimes even the, you, you know, even the best players such as, you know, I think one player that comes to mind who follows this uh, ideology is Nage Faust. Sometimes you gotta make very daring bursts to show your opponent that you are willing to make those bursts so that you can force them to sometimes bait those or think about those. But long story short, I really like Eden's, you know, switch from very aggressive and daring bursts to a more conservative burst plan for this current game. Alright, Zoki's two games up here. 6P calls out. Ooh. That's the, what, one of the most heartbreaking things that can happen. So you hit your round start button and you're ready to buffer into Red Wild Assault and then they burst immediately. So you technically throw 50 burst away. Oh, the 6P slides in there. Counter broken Eden from that high profile poke. That's all his. Plus frames out of that stance cancel. Is Eden gonna burst this time? So we'll get a wall slump and a. Super, is that gonna kill? Yes, indeed. It's always a hard decision to make. Like, do I burst here as soon as I get stuck to the wall? It's it could technically be over if the opponent has a uh, if opponent's combo is uh, not too prorated. Nice snatch out of the DP. So his trying to shimmy back and forth, but this time Eden not flinching, not going for the strike. Uh, so, sorry, the throw option instead opting for the strike. That's kind of what shimmies are universally weak to or, uh, weak against. Far-reaching pokes, especially lows, if your opponent is trying to, you know, backwalk out of your out of your range, then by definition they would get caught by that. And another big counter hit for Eden. It's basically Kai's, you know, win condition plays. 
contain the opponent in the corner and then start striking with your heavy buttons. But a counter hit, it's basically GG go next. Speaking of GG, are we going next? Not quite, because the wall is giving in a little too early for Eden's taste. But now Zokis, tries a flash kick out of the pressure. Ooh, Zokis is back dashing. Is, is this gonna hit? Yes, indeed. What a call out. Is basically the same kind of reversal super that Leo has. The fully fast, invulnerable, forward moving super that can kind of work in tandem. Ooh, what was that? Interesting bouncing sequence there from Eden. I blinked and I missed it, but there was a lot of stuff happening there. And then at the end, Eden somehow ending up in a position where they get to 2 p tag Zokis out of was that the number one, the Rekka one? Artist formerly known as Rekka one or something else. Who are we going into? Big counter hit, immediate burst from Zokis, understandable. We've seen the power of that exact conversion. And that would take Zokis into the corner as well as run a risk of getting the wall broken. There we go, there's the counter play. It's one of the first stun dippers that we've seen from Eden. Extremely uncommon type of restraint from Kai players, I would assume. Especially since uh, stun dipper is such a common counter play against parry stance. 5 frame startup, or I guess it's it's slower nowadays, but still a very fast startup and very fast moving uh, slide that does call you out of uh, out of your parry stance. The neutral Chomp is calling out the reversal super here from Zok. He's trying to go for a fully charged 5D, a little too late there. Zok with the jump D, finds the hit, RC down in case that lands on block. Guarantee your pressure. Guarantee your chances of running pressure against the opponent with very little health. Again, this sequence where I think Eden goes for the frame kill 5B and then gets a quotation meaty throw. That's been catching Zokis off guard. Very, very classic uh, kind of sequence that you would see from Potemkin's back in the day. Like with 5B into Buster. <clears throat> But the same same uh, same principle really applies for normal throws as well, and a lot, a lot of like like a uh, many other characters can kind of utilize that as well, even if you are not a grappler per se. So okay, once again, assuming the parry stance, RC switch side, this will go into a wall break. Oh, I see. So uh, I think purposely choosing to not take the wall with a red assault. And that's, uh, I think I've seen a lot of Leo players actually do that. Instead of taking the wall break, sort of backing themselves away in the back turn stance, waiting for the opponent to tech, either tech downwards or tech forwards. And if you place yourself in a, in a nice place, you can kind of guarantee an anti-air on them as they are coming down from the tech. Well, not really anti-air, but, you know, check on their landing frames. Because I think, wait, Leo should be able to red wild assault out of back turn stance normally, right? Oh, very nice the aggressive dash. However, I think Zokis accidentally crossed up there and got a got a wrong kind of dash as a result. Now Eden very low health, depositing that 50 meter as well as 50 bursts. And suddenly we are situation equalized. Ooh, again, Eden, I was about to say, it's always a little scary when you, uh, you know, when you use your, uh, your burst resources as a, as a gamble for either extending your pressure or bursting them off you. But once again, those gambles have been paying off for Eden. Very advantageous trade from that counter hit as well. Lots of blast frames. Zokis goes into the flash kick RC. The bounce out of the corner. However, Zokis gets a double up. Happy little accidents, as they say. Six heavy counter hits straight into the wall. However, this might actually favor Eden getting out of the pressure. Dragon install. This should be minus on block, but will push away. Immediate DPRC. Zokis doesn't want to deal at all with the dragon. It's very understandable. Kai gets a lot of movement speed and a lot of empowerment for his uh, 
for his normals. Especially lots of uh, chip potential. He just gets a lot of really good stuff out of that dragon install. The downside is that it's very hard to go into that dragon install because you have to be super low on health to activate it. And often enough, you can, you know, oh, hold that off. Sockies has a counter hit here. Lots of resources to make this count as well. Drops it. Who <gasps> scoots past the reversal? What reversal? See a sacred edge? Is that a thing? Or did he get a? Did he get crossed up by accident? Whatever that was, Eden. Oh. Oh, that was a nice idea. However, the first hit of the reversal super not reaching far enough. Zoki's catching the backdash, catching something again, and the Shibi position once again, right outside of Eden's throw range. However, however, going into the air to air, the king. I mean, both the kings are pretty, pretty decent in those air to air situations. Uh, Leo, of course, having his uh, jump heavy from a little further range exchanges, and then the jump slash is a pretty decent one, like just horizontally. And then, of course, Jump K, very good against opponents from below Leo. But, I mean, Kai is pretty much known for the back jump, jump heavy, and back jump, jump slash. Two moves that can, you know, defend your airspace horizontally or vertically. Those of his pressure, break their guard, lots of plus frames, and how are we gonna take this wall break again? Not opting to go into the Wild Assault, and it works out for Zakis. New meta? I thought I thought season three was all about breaking the wall, but Zok is playing the uh so Zok is being the contrarian and saving their resources. I mean it 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 does compute if you can get the kill there without having to spend your burst on wild assault like Zok is did does here. It does guarantee you uh a little bit of an advantage going into the next round. However, of course, now in this round, Zokis is looking to burn all of his resources and get to kill because Eden is on their last life. Got the combo and getting punished as well. This shoot combo is gonna break the wall. Not quite. Frame kill, DP whip into Zokis unleashes the heavy fireball, but Zokis runs under. That's so smart. I think every, like almost every single air fireball that Zokis has seen Eden play has been met by very aggressive dashing forward. And it's like the angle on the fireball is kind of meant, even if you use the S version, which is very uh, steep angle and trying to tag opponents under you, if you can work your way past Kai, there's nothing that Kai can do other than maybe RC. You're coming down into a counter hits recovery state. And Zokis has been very aggressively taking uh, advantage of that. Is it with a 2k? Oh, a little too much momentum here, but converting it into quotation happy little accidents. Electricity is still on, meets Zokis air to air on block. Oh, a little shimmy here from Eden. Perhaps waiting double, double bait if uh, Zokis wants to either release the throw or a reversal. Speaking of reversals, nice making sure that there's no counterplay. That was super, super smart from Eden. Deeping between the hits because Zokis did have the 100 meter, so that super could have been uh, cancelled. d from downtown. Again, guaranteeing Zokis a pressure sequence, this time not feeling uh, confident enough to let Eden take off the wall. Just taking it safe. Good trade for Zokis. Every trade is gonna be very good for Zokis here. Eden is basically on their last pixel. But now, soft knockdown into Zokis' full resources. 5k, that was so smart. One of the only ways... Hard bait here? Is Zokis gonna, gonna just go for the DP? Patience on Zokis' side. Gets to keep the burst to the last round here, potentially. And now Zokis is technically on set point. And because of, you know, Zok because of because of Zokis saved that burst, he's gonna have access to that wild assault, breaking the wall with it. And could take that wall break again. Let's see what Zokis chooses to do. Goes for a hard bait here, as does Eden. But that time Zokis didn't even have the burst yet. Keep go, keep up the pressure. Five piece traded between the both players. Zokis ain't gonna have a kill here, but crosses into the other side. This could be good for Eden. Zokis now contained in the corner. 
and it's gonna take the wall break with a with a soft knockdown. Socks with the 50. Yo, Vincis! Far slash, not hit confirmed, needed the right wild assault though. No. Oh, that has to be burst! Sock is new! Sock is new, that had to be bursted! It's an awkward burst though, because Sock is got a close slash counter hit, unleashing a massive, massive amount of hit stop. So in those heavy counter hit situations, the basically the game is gonna stop for such a long time that you can afford to check what is the opponent doing? Are they bursting? If they are not bursting, then perhaps I could unleash another strike there and then bait the burst. There was just so many options for Zokis there. And not a whole lot of options other than I will burst or I will not burst for Eden. But a good ass set, especially like all these Kai players, I'm gonna go on the record and say I love watching Kai. I love watching Kai, Kai games. It's always... Uh, you know, it, it tends to be these uh, fully thought out footsie matches and Zokis being a, you know, player of the old guard, not, you know, at all scared of engaging even strong neutral characters such as Kai Kisk on their, uh, basically in their uh, own, uh, on their own terms. It's a really cool match to watch and cast. Moving on though, we got some new blood coming through doubly so both sweat sweat uh, Sweat fox as well as chainsaw angel <clears throat> appearing on the screen on bounty hunters for the first time give me a second i'll ping the players Not, not Angel with a shotgun, gonna be even more brutal version of that Angel, it's uh, it's one holding a chainsaw. I wonder if that has some uh, <clears throat> links to Elfalt's wreck a chainsaw lollipop, or ch chain, chain lollipop. I always want to say chainsaw lollipop, isn't that a, isn't that a different game? That game where you have that, uh, that guy with sawed off head and, and the cheerleader chick? <laughs> anyway, so Valentine versus Match here. It's been a while since we've seen a Ram player on Bounty Hunters. But what, what, what better way to... Wait, didn't we have a... I think we actually... I'm actually full of shit. We did have the Valentine face-off just recently. Which was played by... Fucking, my memory is not that good. <laughs> I'm just a TO. I cast hundreds of games every year. How could I remember the games that I've casted for the and past the last month? All right. Society. So instead of reflecting on themselves, so Fox beasts. from Sweden or hell. is gonna face Angel from. Can I determine from this flag without cheating? No, I cannot. Ireland! Shame on you, QK, for not recognizing uh, these common European flags. Alright, the Elfelts are generally uh, recognized by their mm, either set play or extreme offensive potential. Elfelt, one of those characters who is just basically all offense, 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 not really. Not really known for her, uh, you know, defensive capabilities. Pretty much all that she can do is reversal super with 50 meter. And then on the other hand, Remethal Valentine. When she gets you in this position, oh baby, it's gonna hurt. Ram, when she can convert, she converts into massive damage. And when she gets you in the corner, she has some really nice pressure where she doesn't necessarily have to come in as hard as many other characters in the game. You can basically loop the pressure forever if your opponent is not answering, uh, you know, RPSing you the right way. 
But it's not to say that her she could just lose pressure forever. It's a, oh, no, oh, I think that combo whipped there, but I think Angel didn't block on the way down. And either even if even if she did, I think the super from Ram is quite plus on block. Even something like more than somewhere between like plus ten or plus twenty or something about outrageous like uh, outrageous like that. Right into two K, not letting the Rekka whip uh, rip. It's really important to notice, sort of, when you're playing Elfold as well as when you're playing against Elfold, what is the Rekka cancelled out of? So if you're cancelling off for like lighter buttons, lower attack level buttons, there's quite a lot of opportunity to counterplay, even for characters who don't have meterless reversals. 6P could be a thing, depending on the character. I imagine Ram has that option as well from lighter normals, such as like 2D. <clears throat> Generally against non-DP characters, uh, Elfa would be looking for heavy attack level moves such as 6 heavy or 5 heavy to basically go into the Rekka uncontested. Ooh, went a little bit too close and Fox answering with a reversal throw. A little hesitation there. I blinked and I missed it and I didn't see if Fox had a, had 50 meter there, which could explain Angel's hesitation there on the Oki. Alright, 1-0, one big counter hit right from the get-go. And when your opponent has that full burst gauge ready to go, far slash 5 heavy into blue wild assault is actually a fairly good combo for Elvelt Valentine, even from, uh, from mid-screen. She is one of those characters who can combo relatively well with her blue wild assault, even though blue wild assault users are not really known for their ability to hit confirm with their uh, type of wild assault. That would uh, usually go in, in favor of the red users. YRC, get off me, pretty smart. In the corner, we would love to get out as soon as possible. If we go OTG into a cross up, misses the conversion. It's the counter hit jump D. And you better believe it, Alpha Valentine has some pretty, pretty, uh, pretty stable, pretty damaging conversions as well from most of her hits. I think that uh, the hard part, oh, that was so smart, dashed out of the corner and not laying in the line of fire where the sword was exploding, but Fox was ready to counter that with a 2k. Big 5 heavy counter hit. You could see that Angel was buffering that blue wild assault, knowing that if this hits, we're gonna get a big fat conversion. There we go. Through the wall with a super. So far so good. Fox doesn't have a whole whole lot in, in terms of you know defending here. Deflect shield is probably the best that you can do. But depositing it here would certainly be a strategical error because Fox was standing on a or sitting on a round lead or a game uh yeah round lead. Oh that's a big counter hit though! Goes into Rekka Rekka Rekka! You have a lot of options in terms of, you know, whether, like, how much you want to optimize your combo routes as Elfa Valentine. Reversal super here. Is that going to hit? I think Fox, yeah, was walking backwards, right? Yeah, and even the, the sword explosion knocks Chainsaw out of super. Throwing the sword once again, but not able to get out of the explosion radius. Break the wall. Massive windshield, windshield wiper. Here we go into Rekka, and one, two, three. Every time you get into that Rekka position, it's, uh, I would usually give the odds for Elfold to win that round. It's a little hard to get there in terms of, you know, especially against DP characters and characters who are actively counterplaying against it. But once you do actually get your Rekkas off, it's uh, just basically time to guess. There's not very like super deep counterplay or anything as Elva can play you know highs, lows, resets. If if she plays the high low, she can do it fairly airtight. I think the overheads are, you know, have some gap, but generally you're talking about a you know mix-up tool that is mostly gapless. Let's rock. 5k, no confirm. Big boss friends from the rock. Trying to 6p. Boxes, far slash. There we 
go, dash forward, 6P, Rekka, Rekka, Rekka. Angel saying, I'm not quite ready to be put through the wall, especially since Fox has so many resources ready to go. Was faithful Ondo once again. And intercept the jump out of the corner. The two trajectories that you're usually trying to take as somebody who is trying to fight out of the sword pressure is you dash forward to leave the explosion behind your back or you try to jump out and then Remethal is basically trying to RPS you in uh, in terms of, you know, walking that trajectory that she thinks you're gonna take. Right, into one, two, three. Oh, reset! Doesn't go for the full sequence. I actually like that. Because a lot of uh, a lot of finishing moves from from Elfo is actually gonna either not give you a lot of uh, not give you a lot of plus frames, such as like the high or low enders of the Rekka, but also the shotgun does push the opponent fairly far away, so. I'm guessing resetting in some sort of a way could offer you some amount of, you know, extra potential for your Oki situations. Through the wall, soft knockdown, dashing, back dashing out of the five heavy. Rem does suffer quite a bit against some of the farther reaching characters in the game. This could go into a wall break. No, not quite yet. There's the super. Slides into two heavy. Misses the combo though. Yeah, two heavy doesn't go into Pineberry without a counter hit. And supers in... Guilty Gear Strive are not counter hit recovery, unfortunately. Still able to procure the round there for Angel, bringing it two points even. Duel one. Let's rock. There we go, air dash over. Angel staying tight. Even able to 2k jab Fox out of that dash cancel. There we go. I think from that distance where Fox started this combo in previous seasons, you probably don't get anything like this unless you are willing to spend 50 meter. But now, in the advent of season three, you have Wild Assault. You can make, you know, Wild Assault has fixed so many problems for a lot of the current top tiers, such as uh, Ramlethal gets to hit confirm from way, way further away than she could previously sort of fixing one of her few massive problems. And I guess uh, Golden Luz would be another really good example how White Wild Assault fixes his, uh, uh, you know, anti... Uh, fixes his zoning problems or zoner problems to certain ex uh, to certain degree. Right, this should be a kill, right? Yep. Go for the Saprobato. Maximum damage off the wall. And Fox once again taking a lead, but very neck to neck so far. Duel the name one. of the game has so far been, for the most part, whoever. Oh, nice whip punish there, and we see the blue wild assault conversion. Doesn't go for the hardest route. I think you can get a you can get a wall break there, but it gets a little tricky with uh, delays and stuff. But of course, you have great ability to choose your own adventure in terms of elf elf combos. If you never, like, if, if you want to just make a combo that surely knocks them down and you can't drop, you go for the Rekkas. Then, uh, more optimized combos you could route into Pine Barrier and stuff like that to get a little bit more corner carry and more damage out of her combos. So that's like, like a lot of really cool optimization for- Ooh, the red wild assault cancel ends up catching Angel out of- I think it was a Pineberry cancel that she went for there. Simple, midi 2s, 1, 2, super, and we repeat the situation. This time a close slash, sending a- Sending a sword explosion in there, and Angel not blocking the- uh, Midi rock there. Of course, it's a very tricky situation. Your opponent has a positive bonus and a lot of meter coming in, a lot of resources coming in. You can't really, on a good con conscience, just block their pressure. It's basically like red alert. It, like your primary pr priority number one is to somehow make them stop the pressure that they get out of the wall break, heart knockdown. 
but it's easily more easily said than done if you don't have the resources and you're a character like Elfolk who doesn't have meterless reversal you're gonna have to take this pressure and now Fox building so many resources out of that what can you do this is the smell of the game but arguably you could just say you know just don't don't lose the neutral oh nice whip punish there against the flip kick one two three set up the pine berry prompting Fox to go for an immediate burst there Ooh, but now this is a really great position for angel unless fox managed to get a very nice instant air dash out of the corner again we switch inside back and forth nothing personnel kid both players very aggressively trying to keep the superior position not trying to not be contained in the corner elfell of course has the uh, funny little uh, grenade that she can do which does side switch very easily from uh, point blank distance Nice, rounding into the explosion. Okay, with the fire, uh, with the jump D. The jump D is one of those tricky air normals that kind of slows down your air momentum as well as produces multiple hits. So you can use that as a as a mix-up tool, a la, you know, or bridges if you want to make that comparison. A shot of the five heavy. Ooh, that. 6B from Ram hits so far away horizontally. Here we go, you're gonna hold this mix up. And because Angel got stuck into the wall, she didn't even have a have an option to burst out of that. Would have had to be an extremely preemptive burst. Nice again, big 2D counter hit. That 2D has been a. Uh, one of the MVP tools in the round start for Angel so far worked, I think, three times at least, and forced Fox to burst basically right from the get-go. All right, making sure that Bark Slash doesn't hit, drifting backwards, and here we go. The Alpha wreck of pressure. I guess not not quite as uh, as as good of a wreck as the little sister here, but uh, you know, still, even though. Even though Rekka from Ramlethal has been nerfed quite a few times, uh, especially I think the biggest nerf coming in in the season three switch where they, or was it before, where they made so that no forward moving special move anymore has the big uh, Xodeka counter. Basically the, the, the counter that, the, the critical counter if you will. All right, Angel on her last legs here and tries to Tries to close in the dis close in on the <laughs> tries to <laughs> tries to go and destroy the distance or cut the distance. But the thing is here though. So Elf Valentine has uh, her normals are not the, they're pretty good, but they're not the most furthest reaching at all. She's a character that has to utilize her mobility a little bit more than some of the. Uh, other characters so she kind of has to rely on stuff like you know making making people whip and then perhaps using her dash speed to you know make up for it she is one of the fastest characters in the game if not the fastest character at the moment i think chip might still be a little faster but <laughs> basically usurping the fast uh fast dash speed from her sister they say as ram's dash speed got nerfed uh, we we got the basically the same massively fast dash speed in terms of Elf of Valentine into the game. Reversal super, switch sides, and just back dash out of the 2D. I think the 2D not safe on block per se, but you're not gonna punish that either unless you're like point blank range. Nice with punish combined with the red wild assault. Here we go, big damage and a wall break right from the get-go. For a person of Angel's life. What are we gonna go next? Deflection. Oh! That was very interesting. Fox went for that meaty a little too early, I believe, which was why the deflect shield didn't work. If that was a bait, that was 200 IQ from Fox. RC is gonna be enough. Angel obviously has to go for the burst. Deals will be. Her last life. One more hit and it's out of the set. Saprabato on block. Very late. RC. Oh, counter hit too heat. Too, too, too heat. Too, too, too heavy.
But this time it's not meant to be. Fox takes it over. Chainsaw Angel 7 to 2. A really worthy resistance from Angel. I think for the most part, we're able to land kind of equal amount of hits. I think the differentiating factor was, you know, of course, the sort of the overbearing pressure that Ramethal gets when you put your opponent in the corner. And I think Fox was extremely efficient at converting in the con uh, cor corner as well. I can count with probably fingers of one of my hands the times where Angel was able to RPS out of the corner sword pressure. But that's kind of, that co kind of comes with the territory because that pressure is really strong. It's basically Ramlethal's checkmate situation. You get your opponent in that, you pressure them, you find a hit, you take half of their life. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Guild Gear Strive. All right, moving on. Next up is going to be Machamai coming back again on Sin versus one of our older players that we haven't seen for a while, I think. Let me check. Rockless previously appeared, I think it was last year. Yeah, roughly at the middle point of 2023. So it's it's been quite a while, over over a uh, over half a year, half a year since. All right, we got both players in the lobby. Because <clears throat> my up-and-coming Sin player picked up Strive. Uh, how long has it been? Like a couple of months now? Less than a couple of months. I think for this week, my, uh, when we were talking, has been playing Grand Blue uh, much more than Guild Gear Strive for the past couple of weeks. Has been on that Grand Blue grind. However, well, you, you keep playing one game and, you know, you keep up your muscle memory in terms of, or your fighting game execution. A lot of stuff just transfers between uh, between fighting games. As long as you don't fall into that trap where you're like pressing buttons for like throws from a different game or press dash macros for different game or, you know, try to perform combos for a, for a character from a different game. It's, uh, it, it's kind of like stuff like that comes with experience. The more you play and especially the more games you play at the same time, it's going to help you sort of uh, get better at jumping between games. <laughs> and I'm talking about that because I'm basically in the same position at the moment myself where I'm practicing for install and planning on playing both the uh, Guild Gear games, Exert as well as Strive. So I've been trying to play both games daily one after another so it gets a little easier to jump from game to game however <clears throat> there's no exert here only strive and only machamai and rockless it should be a relatively new matchup for mai uh, rockless did disclose uh, a little bit of their uh, lore that they haven't played against sin uh, in a long time either Allegedly, one, uh, one of not uh, one of their uh, one of their less liked matchups, and understandably so. Sin is uh, Sin is definitely one of the goats at the moment in in the current season three patch. Six P on the dolphin, going into a quick overhead. Rockless blocking, however, the pressure is never over as long as Sin has stamina and or meter. There we go, very clean first round for Machamai. Ooh, okay, not getting too fooled about the Up Dolphin. Because the Up Dolphin, if it lands on block, is extremely plus for Mei. But there are 
quite a few different counter plays that you can do against that, depending on uh, your and May's position. Alright, Rock Pless. Backdash out of the safe jump. DDP goes into the one, two, got a super. Ooh, big starter, but doesn't confirm into the two heavy. Mike still has the offensive position. RC, do not get punished there. Misses. Oh, is this the Orca actually gonna power through the DP? Of course, the Orca is a little slow on startup, and I think that was uh, my on already on the later active frames where the in frames have already ended. Here we go with this. Well, uh, the new and improved wall break combo from Sin Kisk. Much more reliable than the old one. Costs two stamina, but it's definitely worth it to just reliably get the wall break right from the get-go. Instant air dash over the beach ball. Now in a sticky situation, your oh goes for the throw a little too early, but so does Mai. Both players fumbling a little bit with a, with a throw button. Mai, however, coming on top of this exchange, of that's very low on health, but had the meter to go for a Hail Mary 3k. Very low profiling option that can slide under a lot of sins high profiling pokes such as Big Driver or Far Slash. We punish there with the Dolphin still in a striking position and Rockless finds the decisive hit very, very close first round or rather first game. Was looking for a moment that it was Mai's game to take but then Rockless somehow I blinked there for a second and Rockless is fighting a winning battle instead of uh, being pressured. Mai is looking clean, especially on the round start gambits. I think Mai has won all of the round starts so far. And again, the active frames of the 2S actually call out the startup of the Dolphin. The risk is, of course, uh, Sin has some difficulties in terms of his uh, strike S-button startups against Mace, which are a little faster. Nice, got that uh, bait on the burst there. Will punish, now very low on stamina. Get the throw, will be able to waste a little bit of time. Misses the midi timing, however. Or perhaps was worried about the reversal super. Could have been the case as well. It's the delicate dance for when you want to counterplay the opponent's DP and or super, how close are you going to venture to the opponent? Because if you hang around too far back, then the opponent will be able to see your telegraph movement and be like, all right, you're 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 probably not going to go in, right? So I don't need to even reversal out of this. Ooh, nice whip punish there on, on the beak. Even on block, beak driver minus 14. So kids, remember to punish your beak drivers. Especially if Sin is out of stamina. We go with the red. White, red white assault, get the wall break. We're gonna go into empty. I think that jump K was meant as a whiff there. Was queuing up the throw mix up and Matsamai sees the throw mix up again. Rockless trying a little uh, too hard to get that throw there. While Mai is already on a on a yummy layer where she's basically like, all right, I'm 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 not gonna take any throws here. I knew that they cannot change society. So Duel one. But hey, that's the that's the name of the game, and both these characters are very prominent with the strike throw. So unless you, or ra rather, if you ignore the the throw option, your pressure can become really one-sided very fast and very predictable. So you, of course, want to keep the opponent guessing as much as possible, especially as May. She does have the command grab as well, and she's basically, arguably, even more strike throw than Sin. Alright, finding the counter hit, not converting into the, co uh, into the throw combo. Go, Elecant, a little, actually got a little bit too oh, nice. Again, very aware of when the opponent does have an opportunity to burst out. And since it's at the end of the round, always probably worth it to spend, sink your last 50 meter into making sure that, all right, if they, if they want to throw away the burst at the very last second, at least I'm going to get that. And worst case scenario, well, you spend the... You spent the RC and then you probably still get the kill combo. 
unless your opponent is like 200 IQ and waits for you to drop the combo and then burst still. My with very decent amount of resources here. Oh, and again, the 3k sliding in the DMs of everybody who has really good high profile pokes and Fire Slash being one of the one of the go-to pokes for Sin when he's on the offense. Very understandable choice to use. Especially when combined with uh, 50 meter by May. Oh, that was a 5 heavy. Luckily for Machamai, the wall had already sustained quite a bit of damage, so it gives up very early. Might still be the burst here. Finds a successful one. We can go low as well. Elk Hunt, one of the premium neutral skip moves for Sin Kisk. Wall break. Now Rock Class with a lot of resources. 50 bursts, 50 tension ready to go. We are going into the, re uh, the uh, YRC. Very smart plays by Rockless. Whips with the two heavy and no record. Uh, no strikes against the uh, whipping jump deep. I think it was yeah, Rockless was on a on a very nice life lead there. So the trade the trade is gonna favor them. Very neck to neck action here right from the start. The cool thing is, at least I don't, I haven't played much with Rockless, but I, I know from personal experience playing with Mai, she's extremely good at adapting to what the opponent is presenting mid-set. At least if she, you know, can comprehend what is happening. It's uh, it's always a difficult thing when you are like slightly new to the game, and or if you see some characters for the first time and you don't why you know haven't quite internalized how their kit works yet so it can, it can sometimes be a little hard to you know adjust the things that you don't comprehend basically if that is the case right, rockless with the round here six speed prematurely stops the dolphin from coming in trying to hold down the airspace who's the queen of the air game now in the close range pressure, don't have any measure or any way to break the wall here with a heart knockdown. So we'll have to be content with what we have. 2k, breaking the gazelle step, however, running out of stamina, so can't com complete that combo into massive frame advantage. In fact, I think that's only like ma plus, plus two or plus three for Sim. If you get a, if you get a DP and just drop the combo after that, so Technically, there's no like super good Oki for Sin in that situation. That's kind of why Sin, it, it's so important for Sin to maintain uh, high stamina, or if you're out of stamina, at least have 50 meter, so that you can always cover yourself if you happen to run out of that uh, very important stamina resource. But all, uh, overall, Sin is very good at juggling the three resources that he uses. Burst, uh, tension, as well as the stamina. I think, in my opinion, one of the more interesting resource management characters, especially in Season 3. Oh, big counter 8 from 5 heavy. That was probably a uh, pretty good burst. Well, definitely warranting a burst here as a lot of different routes that Sin could go from that 5 heavy counter 8. Yeah, there we go, the punish. If there's no meter available, even Hoof, like no matter what special move you land on hit, on hit is gonna be punishable, period, if you don't RC or stamina cancel it. 5P, 5P, 5P. Delaying the burst long enough to not get baited by the standing jabs. How are we gonna get out of this corner situation? Swinging a 6P, but that time Rockless was going low with the slide. Ventures a little too close there, perhaps again baiting the DP, but getting thrown for the troubles. Who we'll slide out of there? Keep little conversion still, one stamina to spend. Who we'll get the trade? But the trade again is not favoring Machamai by any shape or form because she's on her last pixel. Nice interruption there. That time Rockless went for the Heavy Dolphin, which is extremely plus on block, but is technically reactable if you're uh, if you're concentrating on reacting to it. <clears throat> May actually has a lot of stuff like that, 
uh, the, for example, that, the Op Dolphin, as well as the Heavy Dolphin, and Beach Balls. She just has a lot of stuff that you kind of have to keep your eye out for, but is very reactable. Six Heavy also uh, is one of those. I think Six Heavy has like, if you fully charge Six Heavy from May, it's like 40, 40 frames of startup, so more than half a second for you to react and break it. But combining all of those options is like often enough you're 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 trying to guess between a lot of different options and of course if you guess wrong you're gonna get hit by a lot of damage which is not optimal. Ooh, basically with a wild assault and putting even yourself into the corner. Not the not this pressure sequence that Rockless was looking for, however. Instant air dash into a combo works out, reversal super, did Rockless block? Has to spend the full stick of butter. Got caught low there as well. Caught Rockless by by surprise there, sinking 100 meter into the reversal sequence. Ah, it was a hit, but didn't believe in it. Could still be anybody's game. Oh, he goes for the gold first RC, but Rockless in a perfect position. The backwards jumping trajectory. The backwards is the focus word here. If you are moving backwards with your heavy buttons, a lot of characters in this game are just nigh unapproachable, even by 6Ps. Because it would require you to dash forward into your 6P and then it's like, it's just not an angle that you can get very easily. Very nice, instant air dash into the anchor drop jump to heavy. It's been one of the tools that Rockless has been using successfully to throw off Machamai's uh, anti-air timings. And again, May is so tricky. The queen of the skies from the ages past. Even though she, her, her air options have been slightly reduced for this game, she still maintains that uh, the identity as somebody if you can't anti-air her if you can't grounded anti-air if you can't air to air if you can't consistently poke her out of the sky she's gonna get a lot of value for just jumping around and initiating from the skies the ever looming matchup problem that you have to solve with May, no matter what guilty gear game it is All right, sorry about that. Had to do a little bit of TOing there in between. How's it looking here? We're clashing. I think that was clash from DP looked like. Totsugeki gets there. Slightly faster than the poke that Mai was trying to get out. Not gonna be a kill, but very close to one. Oh, by the way, did I, did I miss a point on one player as well? Let me know if I if I forgot to put a point on somebody's account. Ooh, went for the split there from from Dolphin, but Machamai. It was this time Mai who was jumping backwards with the buttons. And even though Sin doesn't necessarily have the best jumping buttons, his uh, his air to air horizontal air to air is. Oh, look at that! The five heavy anti air. Against the ever so extending hurt box of that jump D from Sin. Here we go into the combo. Nice. Warranting a burst from a Rockless. A little more even trade. Nice. Gets a DP. Very low on stamina. But we have a lot of meter to spend here. To waste time. Doesn't manage to mount any sort of reasonable pressure. Play the super though. There we go. You don't necessarily always have to get through the guard of the opponent if you just, you know, stay patient and wait for them to make the mistake instead. Nice, caught the up dolphin and now Machamai with the corner pressure. Ah, oh, was strong. Wanted to go for the throw option there from the from the whip 5B. However, because that re uh, red wild assault whip 5B is so plus. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one she wanted to go for. Set up the safe jump. No frames to go for an S Dolphin there. 
caught by the toes. Oh, this could be very good. Rockless has 50 meter here. Both players whip him the throw. No 50 meter to go invert into a super. My finds a hit. Far slash big tribe, the classic. Sequence that has throughout the ages guaranteed Sin Kisk that if you hit your far slash your S buttons from basically any distance, you're gonna have guaranteed some sort of uh, payoff. Whereas many other characters would require burst from full screen, uh, full screen S buttons or any basically any long range buttons, generally in Guild Gear games. Ooh, that was a counter hit, so my had a quite a bit extended throw hurt or uh, th um, throw frames there. Rockless still brings that home. An important couple of rounds coming up here. Rockless could once again go into a two-game lead here, which would definitely not be optimal for my. And this is option, uh, also not optimal for your health. Losing 50% of her life here out of that 5 heavy counter hit. Jump out. Barocles with the slow down frames. The only thing that Mike could have done there is try to take a throw. DP gets her out of this mess. RC. Ooh. In two. Didn't get the micro dash close slash, unfortunately. The far slash is not going to combo cleanly there. Anybody's game, nice. I think Rockless was trying to go for the 3k here, but Mai with the perfectly timed and spaced 2s preventing it from going online. Here we go, far slash, calls out the 2d, lots of counter hits. Let's see, Rockless still gets the 6p. However, Mei is very known for not having the best 6p rewards at all. Going for the throw a little too early. Rockless also doesn't manage to quite break out of the sticky. Oh, I mean, we we got uh, we got back to the neutral, so that's uh, that's all that counts. And here we go, Rockless taking the two-game lead that we were talking about. My still has a couple of games of buffer here, so it's not all too grim yet. I think the next next win that Rockless takes will be the big the big one. But if Mai man manages to get a couple of a couple of games here, and the games have been so far been fairly even, so I wouldn't be surprised if she she manages to pull it off. Guys, again the two S once again calling out the S Dolphin. Sim two S is like surprisingly good against against Dolphin. It is a little slow, which is a problem against uh, a, uh, a fast forward lunging move such as. Uh, the S Dolphin. But I mean, if you have the frames to get it online, or active rather, it definitely does the job. Here we go, into the late air dash, into a low. My says, enough of this shit. I'm gonna DP out. Deflect chill, very nice timing. We'll put my back to the neutral. Spacing, waiting for Rockless to land. Got the far slash, but no further pressure. I was a little out of resources there. I missed if my did have the stack of wild assault there available, but you know. You don't necessarily want to spend the last of your burst resources unless you really have to. DP once again into close range pressure. Out of stamina though, so we'll have have to let this uh, this pressure go for now. Less finding his way out of the corner. 6P goes under the 5P, 5K from uh, Mai. There we go, big call flash. This time Rockless doesn't have a burst yet. However, Mai didn't quite get the get the wall break conversion that she was looking for. 6P, very nice reaction. Even the S doping, I think you can borderline react to from full screen range. Spent all the burst, or rather all the tension gauge. For the follow-up of the RTL. Again, the 6P. Rockless getting a lot of value from that. However, far slash big follow-up. Quick one. Now this round here. This will be the one. Both players out of their burst meter. Mai with the big counter hit. Close slash. Steps 
in and out of the throw range. This time, Rockless goes for a reversal throw of their own. Might, however, finds a DP out of there. Backdash five heavy, that's a big one. RC, yeah, we want to get the wall. Did he go for the for, go for the royal wild assault though? So this should be fairly okay still for my my god! She went for the 6p, but it was too late, huh? The jump slash, the ever looming headache of everybody who plays against the funny dolphin girl. She went for the right option, but 6p just didn't come out fast enough. The jump slash was hitting too deep already. That is the conundrum that is uh, May Jump Slash. It is perhaps one of the deepest move, uh, uh, rather one of the deepest hitting jumping moves in the game for its startup, should we say. It tends to reach your feet rather fast, especially combined with the, uh, uh, the whatchamacallit, the, the instant air dash angle that May tends to have. She does have a little, you know, she comes down re relatively fast as soon as uh, her air dash ends. So that combined with the good hitboxes, the deep hitting hitboxes, makes it fairly tricky to sometimes anti-air her. All right, the jump out of the corner goes into the big conversion as well. No super here. Saving it for the rainy day. For example, for that backdash drift RC, very classic maneuver from Exert days. Makes sense, because Mai is an Exert player. And speaking of that, that, that maneuver is actually not very available for many characters, because most characters' backdashes actually takes you airborne. But Sin is one of the rare cases that doesn't have an airborne backdash at all. So he can kind of do backdash, then drift RC forward or backwards, and you're still grounded and ready to punish them with a massive... Uh, Grounded counter hit. Alright, Rockless is time to strike back. Lots of resources coming in. I like this play from Rockless not committing before he reached the 50 burst and full uh, tension gauge. And now, yeah, we can take a lot of different kinds of risks because we have all that tension riding behind us. Yep. I think Mai was in, in the uh, in the process of air dashing, so might have not been even able to check out of that air throw. Got Totsugeki, counter hit, kind! Oh dear me! That was definitely a reversal DP attempt, but since Rockless crossed up, it came out as a hoof stomp. Now Rockless is on set point, so this is gonna be a dire situation for Mai. Heart knockdown, what's it gonna be? Backdash gets her out of there once again. I get break on the combo. And the fast dash ends up being an anti-air! Another testament to how bad Sin Kisk is hitting as a, as a jump in. He has really good horizontal range for range for air to airs. However, is this gonna be it? One more hit, misses it! My goes for a reversal throw, but Rockless mining their spacing, going for a little bit of a shimmy there. The back step. And with a decisive 5 heavy, is going to take Mai out of that set. 7 to 3. Very evenish set, though, considering uh, the con contents of the match. I think the biggest problem for Mai was uh, from a lot of sequences. She got a lot of really good hits, but a lot of the times it was like lacking the ender super to get the wall break to sort of get keep the ball rolling, so to speak. And it's 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 especially like for a character like Sin Kisk, who is so good at juggling resources back and forth and kind of has to juggle those resources because he relies so much on, you know, having one of those resources available for all of his conversions. It's so important to get the wall break. All right, stepping up to the plate next. Another first timer, Mellow Rage Anji. I'm gonna be re uh, representing the UK colors versus one of our uh, one of our most uh, active. Jacko players on Bounty Hunter's roster, Decoy Snell. 
representing the Netherlands. Ooh, we got both players with the clout gas, as we call it in the industry. Both players, I mean, both players have been playing quite a bit for the past month. And I mean, considering what I know about decoys now, they play, they play, <laughs> they play, they indeed do play. And play at a very, very high level, they do as well. Yeah, weird matchup. This is uh, definitely so characters who have a good range. Anji tends to have bullets to RP as many of these long range characters because of uh, Suigetsu no Hakobi, the gorilla spin. However, Anji is not the most comfortable parrying incoming projectiles, and a lot of the junk that is coming forward in this matchup is the thrown minions, which you probably don't want to dance through. So I think in this matchup, Anji will have to find a balance between, you know, poking those incoming minions and perhaps trying to RPS with the dance. We counter hit immediate burst by Melo. Ooh, that was very minus there. What is the... Oh, is the Nagi Haon block something like minus 6 or minus 7? Something like that. Very hard to punish if you're, if, if Anji doesn't end up like right in front of you. But that time, that wouldn't be the case. But Anji players will also realize this and love to use that RC. Give up the pressure. And speaking of pressure, somebody mentioned in the chat already, but Decoy Snail combined with their trusty old Jacko. Once you get a, once you get your ball rolling, get your goobers out, and especially when you get to put your opponent in the corner, her pressure is relentless. However, Mellow not giving a damn, just dashing in there, close range, bam, big counter hit. Here we go. When the goobers are not an issue. Uh, you of course have a lot of uh, a lot of more freedom to dance through Jacko's um, Jacko's normals. Here we go. Good timing there. The timing is basically everything when it comes to playing neutral against Anji. You can never prevent Anji from gambling. It's like you. Oh, is that, is that gonna reach? That will actually reach, and I think that might have actually punished Melo's backdash. Here we go, setting up the corner pressure. Cash it out. And we could... Yo, that's actually gonna kill, never mind. We're not gonna have to think about the next screen at all. Here we go, looking for a whiff punish. Ooh, end up... 3D minus there, good call out on the deflect shield. 1, 2, 2P, 2P. Oh, we got that. I, I think Melo Rage used uh, the butterfly a little early there and got the hit. Was probably looking for the wall slump and to set up more pressure. But I mean, this is, this is pretty okay. Pretty okay as well. Find the hit. Get the wall break. Get the round. 1 0, -oh, Melo. Ooh. Ooh, that rhymes. Ow! You know that's one of one of the uh, one of the small uh, pleasures in my life to create accidental rhymes. Feels really good. You know what else feels really good when you dance through your opponent's round start option and get a counter hit close slash for Anji. Nice chase there. Yep, realizing that that is indeed an option from a lot of these situations. Uh, Jacko can pick up the minions and start running away. In fact. For depending on who you're playing against and what buttons you're thinking you're gonna face, that might be one of her more safe options. Alright, drop the minion, go through the wall. Melo is gonna have decent resources here. Full burst 50 meter. Yeah, and I, very understandable for Decoy to just mount the defensive perimeter here or a neutral perimeter. Approaching Anji while Anji has 50 meter is very scary, especially for a character who is not necessarily uh, about the uh, 
uh, the gorilla way of life, so to speak. Ooh, very cool there! Using the new feature, the, the steering on Shin. Steering forward and putting uh, himself in a position where... Where Melo was able to come keep up with the pressure. Ooh, didn't quite get there. The idea was to dash deep enough to grab Melo out of the gorilla spin. Ooh, and Shiki! Very nice and converts fully! That's so cool! And that didn't even... That didn't even uh, sacrifice any... Nesses like any big resources for the Oki. Got basically a corner close slash Oki as as you have it. Right, immediate detonation. Be careful. To not walk into your own minions. Nice block on the overhead. Very unseeable in the uh, in the current day patches. Used to be fuzzy guardable once upon a time in Van vanilla strive. When Anji players were extremely sad, but you know, this character has received buff after buff after pop. Or rather, Anji is one of those characters who has gone through a lot of different changes, right? So it's not all buffs all the way around. There's a lot of buffs, nerfs at the same time, turning into adjustments. But the, the trajectory of the character strength has been on an upward trend for sure for Anji. There we go, that's what we were talking about. Sometimes you have to, you know, not necessarily commit, but wait for the minions to be thrown at you. Take them out and then approach instead. However, now in the corner, Dinko is running a little low on the minion gauge, so won't have the best Oki here. The last ditch effort, attack command does break Melo through the wall, though. Oh, what do we have with this? 50 meter to take out the goobers for free and keep up the pressure. A price you will happily pay if you take the opponent into the corner with a couple of goobers. Ooh, that was very tricky from a from an angle where I think Melo probably thought that there was not gonna be any uh any follow-up. Connor hit 2D. It's a corner carry as well. We're setting up the sandwich. Never mind. We're not setting up the sandwich. We're setting up an F Shiki once again. It's a maneuver that you really have to hard read for. It's not something you can really react to. You choose the high, you choose the low, and you live with your decisions. That's very expensive escape, but perhaps a necessary, in necessary investment against a character such as, you know, Jacko. I think Jacko is one of those characters against who you almost pay any amount of resources to guarantee your way out of the corner. If you get out of the corner with 50 meter, hey, that's that's pretty good. That's, uh, I consider that a worthwhile investment. And so do many other players. Right, taking a little breather here before heading into the heat of the battle once again. Yeah, there we go. Dancing through the throne minions really isn't the best you can do. Is the power power of the dance really relies on the fact that you can dance into the opponent's uh, guard basically while they are still recovering. But if you if you dance through a projectile like this, I mean that was pretty decent, I guess. But if you can't get on the point flank range, then you can't really utilize that parry per se. Soft knockdown. Meter for meter dancing out of Oh my goodness! Anji 6P does have quite a bit of upwards range. Trying to shimmy, decoy, but decoy not biting still. Eventually, you're gonna have to press a button or try to escape. Many characters in Guild Gear franchise, as is, gay, as is uh, the case in Guild Gear Strive as well, will basically just keep up their pressure forever unless you do something. And the longer you keep just normal blocking and holding your defensive position, the worse your stonks are gonna get over time. As we have that little bit of a mechanic, the risk build up. Ah, nice bait there! 
The YRC was the option that Melo tried to use this time to avoid getting cornered. But Decoy was already on that Yomi layer. One, two. Yeah, the pop up of the uh, of the modern day Nagiha, giving Anji some uh, definitely required, uh, sorely sorely necessary uh, combo potential. This is a character, after all, that you know relies on gambles. Doesn't really have the neutral to write home about at all. It's just about taking big risks and making big combos happen. Oh, oh, oh the back, that's BRC, or the blue RC. Ah, missed the wall break, but still <laughs> avoided, a, avoided a massive incident there, even though Decoy got a, got a forward check out of the wall. Bringing it two points even. Pretty much every single game. Uh, or rather, every single matchup of the evening has started exactly like this. Both players take one, take one, take two, take two, and then we'll see if uh, one player starts pulling uh, pulling ahead. Ooh, but that that dance went into very very deep. Counter hits it five heavy, and I I reckon that's a pretty decent starter. Opting to even hold the wall here. The butterfly or the bird actually screwing up the finishing sequence. Once again, drift forward, drift backwards. Still a sequence that I, I wonder if this favors Jack, uh, Jacko or Anja here. Melo does have the life advantage. However, going back to neutral against Jacko, not the best prospect for sure. Trying to spend the meter to kick back into... Ooh, who is it? <laughs> Is it Anji? Yes! The Glow Slash just doing a little bit too much damage there on the trade. And once again, yeah, immediate burst. That was a, another dance into a Glow Slash counter hit. Uh-oh, speaking of the devil! Melo has been hitting a couple of very nice spins here. Counter hit, six heavy. Sorry, five heavy. And still dances into the super. Very good control here of Anji. A lesser player would have just broken that wall without a hard knockdown. Melo Rage definitely recognizes how important it is to get a get the heart knockdown against the zoning character such as Jacko. Once you get in there, keep your advantage. That's what characters like Anji are all about. I mean, technically Anji, Anji is the kind of character who just lands one hit and just murders you from that one hit, but hey. Sometimes you have to make them guess twice. <laughs> or most times you will have to make them quest twice, even after your massive behemoth Gargantuan close slash counter hit combo. Alright, got the throw. OTG to heavy into a butterfly setup. Decoy is also ready to invest quite a bit of resources to get out of the corner situation. Of course, when you are the pixie control character, you would probably pay the same amount of meter as Anji does to get, you know, to prevent Anji from playing the game at all, right? Right, YRC works out. The wild assault. Recovered. Oh, nice back that shimmy into. This should be a kill, right? If Melo gets the wall stick, yes, indeed. Not missing with the BMB combos at all. Very important feature. Oh, out of that trade. Was attempting the shimmy once again. Diko initially not biting, but still gets counter hit by the... Oh my god, look at these shimmies. What is this, Street Fighter? Yo! Chill! Chill Melo! Moving all over. Seems to be in the same place all at once, but just... It's... It is literally shredding at Anji. I'm seeing, I'm seeing Anji right in front of Decoy's nail, and Decoy probably seeing it too, but Anji is not there. Anji is in a super position in every single fucking state at once, and when you strike, Anji is not there. Somehow he's not there. We're seeing quantum physics at large here on Pony Hunters. Immediate burst once again, gotta... Really bad guess there on round start. Melo Rage returns the favor, burst as well. Nice 2k, prevents Melo coming in. 
it's the sort of the close mid range where you can kind of prevent Anji from getting their spin started at all, which is probably like two ranges that favor Jacko would be at her kick range as well as on the full screen range. Now the RC, there's not a whole lot of stuff that Decoy could have done there. Could at, at least save themselves from getting counter hit by doing that PRC. But if you trigger the guard point and RC, you're still gonna get the fish right. And the fish reaches really far away and has a lot of active frames. Last frame from Shin. Oh my God, we're moving. However, this time Decoy's now ready to bounce forward. We have so many attack commands still ready to spend. Yeah, that's gonna be a kill for sure. Triggering the guard point on the way out. However, Melo didn't have the best distance for striking afterwards. Set up the sandwich, or it looks like it looks like Decoy is setting up the sandwich, but it tends to lead into the F Shiki setup. The multiple overheads. Good activate, minion here, parry, oh my god, that was so smart. So, so Decoy activate the minion parry and went for a throw instead. Very conscious of the defensive options of Decoy here. YRC, get off me. Yeah, Decoy spending everything, throwing everything on kitchen sink here at Melo in order to procure back the real estate. So it goes, we move from the left corner to the right one. Close slash, putting Decoy onto the ground once again. Here's the mix. 2P2P, no fear whatsoever. Melo was doing the shimmy dance there. That's the, again, like we, we said before, the shimmy is vulnerable against aggressive poking. When you are moving backwards, you're probably not defending yourself sufficiently. Same goes for backdashing as a shimmy. The backdashes in Guilty Gear Strive are relatively punishable, only having like five to like four to four to six frames of invus, and after that, it's it's all fair game. They counter it immediate burst from Mello. Triggers the parry on Minion. Not the best. Oh, there we go, the fish. Basically trusting that Decoy will try to dash in. Oh, got the backdash with the Kara overhead. And now looking for about one more hit, but there is still some considerations for Decoy Snell to just perfect Melo Rage here, but considering the amount of resources Melo has available, it's probably not gonna be very likely. Yeah, just drifting into the 2S. Simple and clean is the way that you are making me feel this matchup. Ooh, but it's Decoy's turn to play the back dash shimmy here. Drops it before going into the wall break. One more hit could be it. Activate. Red is the name of the game here. So the minion gauge is basically going to be almost infinite as long as that red buff is active. Ooh, delayed the gold burst there. Are you gonna burst? No burst coming through. But might as well play the play the bait there at the very end of the round. Smartly by decoy snail. Alright, assume the defensive perimeter, or perhaps the zoning perimeter, what we should call it. With the goobers going back and forth by the low. Immediate burst for a mellow. Counter hit 2D. Oh, you're going for a right here. Lucky for decoy that Mellow didn't have you know, the best of resources available. Wow, the fish just bumps Decoy back into the corner. 2P, 2P, 6 heavy. New frame trap. Lots of plus frames from that call. Deflect shield tries to... Oh, it still works! It was still active. I guess because the... The... The RC slowdown frames extended the active frames. And the air 5 heavy. We, we can definitely work with that. Come to my minions. Yeah, I dare you. I double dare you. Activate. Blue is the color this time, so this will make the minions unkillable. But Deco basically getting no value whatsoever from that install super. Into super. Yes, indeed. Iseogi is gonna kill. Despite the little amount of damage that is Iseogi done, that does, uh, I think generally considered one of the one of the lightest hitting supers in the game. It is still gonna do a little bit and guarantee the wall break damage as well. 
So happy to happy to take that super wall break at the end of the round when it's down to the wire. 6P still works. That, that was looking like a very late 6P, but still gets it off. And as it has been in this matchup so far, both players unleashing the blue burst extremely fast. Swinging a miss. Very near miss there with that 5 heavy from Decoy. Not in the range to punish. We were talking about that earlier as well. Only minus 7 on that... Uh, on that Nagiha on block. But especially this patch, because you can perform it as Gara. Oh, mix up time question mark? No. What was that? Just a massive amount of respect from both players. Another one. Combining RC with it. Decoy probably pretty happy just holding that for now. Not taking any huge risks. Considering the type of maneuvers that Melo has been performing, they are, for the most part, like, you know, schmooving around a lot. And if Decoy was to just get baited and hit a button there, hit a burst there, hit a hit a YRC there, just do anything, a lot of the times the, the moves that Melo has been putting out are, you know, would be baiting whatever Decoy would try to do. So patience has been a virtue. You all speaking of... Look at that. The back and forth, the little sh the shiggity wiggity. Take a step forward, let them react, go backwards, and then get the punish. Oh, is that gonna go into the right direction? Hello? Anji, where are you at? Wrong side! A little bit of a blunder there for Decoy. That would have been almost a decisive cash out. But to be a to be a gentleman, Melo makes the same mistake, I presume. Let's decoy off the wall. But we are spending all of the resources to get the opponent stuck to the wall. No! Missed the combo again. 6P, wrong direction, or perhaps the right direction, who knows? Ah, a perfect timing there on the six heavy. I think decoy was that a parry command or Attack command. I think that was a parry command. So, Melo, perfect timing there on the strike, not striking into the parry frames of the minion. Again, there we go. Perfect parry, putting Melo back into the corner. And now the mix. What's it gonna be? Multiple overheads. Good defense so far by Melo. But the back. Oh no! Went for a little early. Putting themselves out of the corner, Decoy fighting back, cashing out, that's gonna be a kill! Decoy still on the trail of Mellows, or on the tail, rather. Now letting the opponent run away with the lead. And we've seen, I think we've seen these comebacks from Decoy on Bounty Hunters over and over and over. It's not one, two or three even. They're the master of comebacks, if if I'm concerned. So I'm a firm believer that anything can still happen in this matchup. But we have to keep in mind that Anji is a very explosive character, so if Decoy... Like, Decoy has managed to keep up the control very well, but he could all snowball out of control in a matter of, you know, minutes. And you can't play those 10, 15 second rounds. You get a couple of those in a row, and it could be Mellow Rage on 7 before you can say... Uh, what's a, what's a cool world word? Spin. To win. Because, I mean, who would spin to lose? That's just fucking stupid. Ooh, okay, 2 PPP, spacing yourself away and basically sliding. I, I think, was that FD blocked by Decoy? Basically spacing perfect range on, on the far slash. And surprisingly, oh, well, that got close slash. We got a kill here. Jesus, there's 101 different ways to kill here. Full burst, almost full gauge of wild assaults as well. And a cor uh, close slash corner position. Right. Soccer kick, dancing, but the fish just barely outside of range. Get the cross up, switch the sides again. 
But you can't keep on performing those minion con commands forever. Eventually, you're going to run out. And that was probably the opportunity for Melo to get out of that corner position. Meets with the projectile. Meter for meter again gets to activate the attack command, which caught Melo out of that, whatever that was. Here comes the artillery kind on the 2S, launching the minion from above. I, I kind of like that. I think Decoy unleashed the anti-air a little too soon and get ba got baited by the jump D of Anjis, but then saving themselves with the purple RC. This is what I'm talking about, the control. The blunders are there sometimes. I think it goes without saying, when you're playing against Anji, you can't always be right. Anji will be gambling like machine gun gambling against you it's it's a it's a barrage of reads that you have to take sometimes you guess right sometimes you guess wrong but the thing here is that decoy has been able to guess right enough to maintain a decent amount of control making Anji's life miserable as miserable as possible and not giving the free ins Ooh, that was very interesting but extended active frames for Ujin because collided with the minion? Question mark? Black shield still works out and the quick pounce into a flip throw. No such pressure. Finding the Kara overhead. Overhead again. Melo does have the meter to RC if they want. And I think this is. <laughs> yeah, finally cashes out. I wonder what the rationale to not cash out there was. Probably because uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe Melo just hit confirmed that the overhead hit, so they're gonna get a corner position Oki anyway. So why should we go through the wall, right? Kind of the same ration rationale as why you know uh, wall slump loops you. <laughs> While we're talking about that, good burst bait here from Melo. Once again, keeping at least one game of lead versus decoy at all times. Those are the quick things that can happen when you're facing Anji. The explosive potential, one good read. And Nagiha would have popped decoy into the air and potentially taken the wall as well from that range. Soccer kick. Empowering the minions. One thing I learned recently, that it is much better to do a soccer kick on the minion that will actually empower your minions to uh, function a little bit differently. A 2D, and now the left right. Oh, actually goes for a throw instead of the left right. Clean air throw. Multiple strikes with the use of the butterfly. Sometimes the butterfly, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes the butterfly kind of screws up your combos. I think for the most part, if the opponent blocks your setup, then there's gonna be no, no problem. It's just the butterfly is gonna be a, gonna be a bro, and not do anything nasty. And depending on the hits that you land, you might actually land a hit on a backdashing opponent, a airborne opponent. Sometimes for those, uh, you might get a very awkward hit that you have to hit confirm in a particular way really fast. Ooh, the 2D going through, getting a very decent combo and a backdash shimmy. Burst is available. However, it would be kind of a hero play here. Melo... Yeah, look at, look at the amount of life that Decoy had left. That would have been an absolute foolish buffoon play if uh, Rage, uh, or if Melo went for the burst there at the end. I better save it for this round. When you are still full, uh, full hit points. Like this. Backdash. Anticipating the landing frames. Plus friends from the Shin. What's it gonna be this time? Nagiha pops up high. No pick up this time. YRC, get me out of here, says Decoy. Nice. Dropping the minion. Dropping the parry. So that there won't be any anti-air for me coming down. So beautiful when you're working as a team with your goobers. Uh-oh. But here we go. Melo has so much, re so much meter. Like shield. Get the guard crash frames, blast from the fish. Oh my goodness, Benz it all! Oh, is that gonna be enough though? I think not. Dropping the combo before the wall break happens though. So smart, 6 feet. Oh my goodness, Mellow Rage Anji. 
truly, truly Schrodinger's Anji. Where is he? Nobody knows. Spending 100 meter for that combo and smartly dropping it before it wall breaks so that you don't have to play neutral anymore against Decoy. Very clean. A good mix of shenanigans and fundamentals. Wow. I guess nothing more to say. Welcome to Bounty Hunters. That's uh, that's some that's some cool ass Anji tech. I don't think I've ever seen so much Anji tech uh, during one set. But I mean, Anji is that one character who you kind of want to be spending a lot of meter to get things to happen because your your natural your zero tension pressure isn't like the most outstanding that's kind of been the the case for anji for, throughout the uh the lifespan of guild gear strive like anji is that one character who needs 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 the meter to make nasty things happen speaking of nasty things <laughs> next up it gonna be May Mirror. Our primary May boss of Finland is gonna face Day Dynamic, a May player from Romania. First time showing on Bounty Hunters for Day. Uh, there was a little bit of lore attached to this matchup where Day was planning on challenging Rygand sometime soon. And we are, of course, jumping the gun here and getting the matchup FD7 form on and Bounty Hunters. They cannot change society. So instead of reflecting on themselves... Yep. Now the big question on everybody's lips, of yes. course, is... Who is the better May? Because as we all know, <laughs> Mirror Match are the de facto, no questions asked, after the Fat Lady Sins kind of a uh, uh, proof who is the better player, period, right? Because that's how it goes in fighting games. Good timing there on the burst by day. Able to get not just the combo breaker, but 50% uh, of uh, Rygan's burst resources out. Break the wall. Start the game, game very fast. No breaks from the get-go. That's, uh, that's Rygan's life mantra, if I, if, I, if, I, if I can make one for Rygan. Nice way punish there on the 6 heavy. Get the Dolphin S, Dolphin RC. He's playing that we have a lot of meter, sorry, we have a lot of uh, explosive potential available from this side as well. Interesting, they choosing to not engage in that Oki situation at all. I assume because Rygant was fully charged on, or fully loaded on the tension bar. So not wanting to mess with the Super RC at all. Yo, from which side? There is a lot of like, oh, nice six speed to the right direction. Backdash out of the blast frames of Rygan's up dolphin, and now oh, got caught by the six heavy into decently large conversion. Rygan looking for that one more safe chum. No escape from that available unless you have 100, I would suppose for for May. Oh, that was that was actually smart. That might actually be bigger than walking out of the corner. So of course, that e the o easiest counterplay against uh, up doping in the corner would be micro walk forward, make them miss, close slash punish on the landing. But Rygan instead went for the two heavy, which basically plummeted Day into a massive, massive juggle. I mean, not being a May Master myself, not sure which combo would deal the more deal more damage, but I think the two heavy might actually have more damage potential there, especially since it's gonna juggle Day into into like a place where you don't get the wall break immediately either. Really cool tech there. Alright. Open as OTG. Like in a day, switching positions back and forth. A little too early on the throw. That's been a it's been a continuous theme today on Bounty Hunters. Doing the splits back and forth. Which side? Nobody knows until it lands. Allegedly. 
Nice Rygan unleashing the anti a little too early, getting baited by the jump D. It's of course one of one of Rygan's trademark features, but many other May players enjoy this feature of the character as well. Having a lot of uh, RPS potential for when is the jumping gonna land and from which side, at which timing, at which angle. Right, through the wall once again. Spend it all. Spend money to make money. As they say, close slash. Casually catches the back dash. Nice back dash out of the six heavy this time. I mean, they they got caught by that six heavy previously, so it definitely depends on the situation and the spacing. Oh, this time the close slash anti air, the big, big combo starter. Rygan cashing out big time. Only the cherry on top of the cake was missing. Rygan didn't quite, wasn't quite able to build it to that 50 tension. That would have surely been a big thing there. But so it goes. Day opens it up as well. The word on the street is 1-1. One, one. And Rygan and Day are ready to measure each other a little more. Right, attempting the whiff punish. However, the 5 heavy is not the furthest reaching button. If you want to reach your opponent aggressively, I think you would go for moves such as May Bar Slash, which does, in fact, have quite a bit of range. Overhead, into plus frames. Ooh, Day finding a very nice angle again, utilizing that jump D. The classic. Now that. Now that. Oh, there we go! Not even trading this time. Yeah, it's gotta, it's gotta be the better reward because Rygan is going for it. Here we go, Deflect Shield. Good one. I mean, I guess I said earlier that there's no way out of that safe jump unless you have 100 meter, but I guess that's technically not true because you can just you can just deflect chill safe jumps in the current day and age. Oh, Mr. Punish! And this time they didn't miss theirs! That's the, that's the nasty part about how 3k works for Mei. Some of her conversions will just have to kind of naturally flow into the 3k really fast, so if you uh, are at, I guess, if you are at the wrong spacing or I'm not ne necessarily sure like what governs whether you lose the combo or not I, I'm, I'm guessing it's the spacing for the most part but if you don't have the combo and you miss the miss the gatling into 3k then tough shit you're gonna take the punish instead right with a lot of meter here can even do yes the orca rc and get the mix up there as well doesn't lead into a big combo but I mean you do get a little bit of a mix up there with nerves of steel, waits for Day to land in front of them. Yet the throw. Heavy Dolphin, S Dolphin in two. We're still holding the corner. S Dolphin back dash. Ooh, there we go. The active frames, the hitbox, the two trademark features. Oh, but misses the misses the well. A big opportunity for Rygan. Yep. Counter hit, to heavy, miss the Dolphin, pick up the combo, and, yeah, that's, sh uh, is it gonna be a kill though? It's gonna be a lot of damage though, this combo is not very pro-rated, just barely not enough, but Rygan is gonna get this combo sequence, or rather this uh, safe jump sequence. RC, what are we gonna go for? Too heavy, yep, the anti-air that actually has rewards. So one of the reasons why Rygant is not swinging around with 6P that much is it, it, it all boils down to it all boils down to what we're talking about very often when Mei is on the screen. 6P is not the most lucrative starter for Mei at all. Often it's just gonna end your combo immediately and just go into a heart knockdown. But if you're fishing with a too heavy instead, oh baby, if you get a counter hit. Completely different kind of numbers. Yeah, going with that very safe sequence there. I think Rygant could have had the wall break combo if they wanted to, but since they had burst ready to go, they went for a slightly different kind of setup. 
very smart you always want to have at least the opportunity or that rather the you you want to put on you basically want to say to your opponent all right here's my sequence it has counterplay and you're gonna guess whether i counterplay or not right, missing with the dolphin i get getting a 5 pp starter they doesn't want to get wall pro you, uh, okay may please what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? I think that was jump slash and too heavy colliding there in the air. Alright, third one for Rygand. Picking up some speed. Our Finnish hero, the core member of the Esports organization Yalluminati. Man. Duel one. Let's rock. The esports organization strongly uh, reeking of alcohol. It's looking to take an early advantage here on this main mirror today. Ooh, they not faced by that mix up at all. I guess you would know your own character's options and be able to RPS the most effectively. Speaking of, oh, missed the combo. Got a happy little accident afterwards. Break through the wall, got a hard knockdown. Dragon does have burst resources ready to go. But yeah, it's a very logical kind of play that they made there. So because Dragon didn't have the meter, but did have the burst available, the burst, uh, the uh, the command crab or the throw would cover both the respect as well as the deflect shield options. From the split back dash, late back dash into oh, probably a good burst that would have probably killed. But again, the anti air five heavy. It's cool to see how the approach to these anti-air situations are very different for these players. I think Raiden, for the most part, is waiting for the reaction to heavies, whereas Day is more or about the preemptive five heavy life. Nice with sides. Backdash into a quick dolphin. Day not letting Raiden run away with too much momentum here. Keeping uh, keeping uh, keeping up with the bald man. Two, three. Lots of opportunities for both players to make magic happen here. Mankind news. And until the next round starts, here we go. 5k is the call-out option which starts up fast enough, apparently. To call out the S Dolphin. Uh, lots of counter hits. Then the sequence where he saved didn't uh, didn't overextend into Rygen as Rygen did have the blue burst available as well there. Yeah, we got the jump slash goes active before days. I think that was gonna be jump heavy, moving backwards, which is a slightly slower move than the jump slash. Again, the back dash into an immediate S Dolphin. Ends up being the whip punish option that catches Rygen from swinging the far slash. And now Day's time to play it. Plays it very safely again. Day just doesn't want to fuck with any of that 100 tension. Oh, Rygen loves that sequence. Yeah. Come down and just before you touch the ground, just before you think they might be unleashing their anti-air, because you, I think you do most of the time put yourself on landing recovery when you do those uh, air shenanigans. Just a couple of frames before you land, go for the air orca, and if they press anything, if they try to punish you, well, they're gonna be very sad. Ooh, there we go. This time, Rygen with the five heavy. We got the footsies here as well. Jump B conversion into a clean one. Not the most uh, damaging one, of course, being a being a itsy bitsy poke. Rygen taking the wire C, taking the burst as well with his face, but at least it's done now. And no more escape for day out of this pressure sequence. Even losing the 50 tension because they went for a for an FD there. That was a very hard call. 
which one is they gonna spend if they reach for the cookie jar if they reach for the immediate rewards and try to push Rigand away with FD that means they're not gonna have YRC available anymore but on the other hand if you don't try to do something immediately perhaps we never get to that 50 meter at all All right, S, Dolphin with Punish, even on... Well, if you don't get a counter hit, there's not going to be a lot of rewards from that. Is, I guess, the major down... Oh. <laughs> yeah, danger here. So, I think Rygant was uh, completely happy letting Day run towards that corner. Even if you're running forward, what the game checks is if you're moving away from the opponent or not. Even if you're forward dashing, it will count towards your negative penalty, right? So if, here's a public service announcement for you kids. If somebody is dashing away from you, let them. Let them play themselves into the negative penalty. That's in your favor. All right, with a cool wall break. Off the soft kind though, so Rygen gets a opportunity to play immediately here. There it is once again, that backdash with punish S Dolphin this time with a counter hit, making count. This will be a hard climb for Rygant. Reflect shield, negating the safe jump setup as we... Uh, as we realized that was an option earlier. Alright, one combo. One more combo. Ah, ah, ah. Reversal super, yeah, that's the, that's the option. Oh, what? yeah, I get it, I get it. Because if you go for the Orca RC, it's really, really annoying, right? Because you not only have to deal with the mom uh, deal with the momentum breaker, but you're also probably taking a mix-up because the orca hits later, and then you have to guess for high-low. Yeah, no, no wonder they has uh, has not been feeling uh, you know approaching Rigant after the heart knockdown wall break if they have 100 meter ready to go. Right, deflect shield once again. Even with that forward moving momentum, it did push Rygen just barely far, far enough away initially. Damn. What happened? I think at one point of this game, Rygen was in a fairly bad position, but he just stole the, stole the round away. And after those four Four first games of data, Rygant definitely has figured something out. I'm not sure what it is though. I've seen I've seen both players land plenty of hits. I think it's just the just the decisiveness and the flow. When Rygant gets into this position, Rygant tends to be able to keep the pressure. Just get the wall breaks, get the subsequent subsequent hits. Don't let the prey escape. Big hit coming in here. And this time, no no 100 meter available. So we are going indeed into the safe jump setup. It should be a kill as well. Yeah, Rygan on a good conscious can't really unleash that burst here. Would be quite a bit of a risk here. 5k into... Wow, that's a, that's a full conversion. May 5k is definitely one of my favorite buttons to watch combos of. It's such the reach is so far. It's kind of like a far slash in a way. It's like a far slash that is not far slash and it converts so well, especially if your opponent is in the air. Right? Missing the setup within the safe jump, I suppose, or maybe that was a safe jump or like. Uh, meant to whiff it into a throw setup, I suppose. All right, day still signs of life here. We're gonna have to go for a little bit of a run back, and that run back will have to consist of exactly. Well, I, I guess two games for now to bring it even, but eventually it's gonna have to be four more for day. Right, relatively even trade here, Rygen goes for an immediate instant air dash. And as we've as we've sort of figured out is so May and anti-airing. 
it is it is of course a problem against herself a problem against herself as well there we go with the 6p i mean that's one way to get like some rewards out of 6p but even then the the combo for a day just didn't really hit very hard huh there we go rc dragon still wants to play this has 100 meter so can keep this pressure going for very long tap dust into a kill we go it was a gamble but hey as they say in the industry if you never gamble you're never gonna win and Rygut was sure that I have pretty decent hand to gamble here we have the ace pair if we burst here there's uh, still a decent chance that we come out of this victorious FRC, oh, landed a hit there as well. Is that a kill? No, the s in at the end whips. Dragon moving out of the corner. That was so good challenge. I think going air to air is probably overall slightly better than trying to ground it anti-air. At least then, oh, but all that, the Rygan with a big two heavy counter hit conversion. And because of the right wild assault, they lost their ability to burst in the middle of the combo as well. Now Rygan looking for that one more hit. Oh, is they gonna do the same? I can do that combo too. Yeah, baby. And this time Day is gonna have a little bit of extra sugar at the end. Look at that, 70%. Mm -hmm. It's gonna completely whip, right? No, of course it's the 100 Orca RC. The Orca just has your back. If nobody else has your back, Orca has your back. Especially when you get, get when you get the extra fifty. Hey man! All right, Rygand getting to the six points position here. The time when one more to go. Now you should definitely not lull yourself into the sweet release of all pressure and think. Yeah, my my opponent just has three points. Only three points, and I only need one. How hard could it be to finish this? When you fall into that false sense of security, that's the time when, you know, the hungriest of opponents will launch a comeback on you. And I'm sure Day is extremely hungry for this set. You never, you never, ever, ever want to let another player of your character have the best of you. Because like we said at the start of the set, this, this, this basically... Oh, wait, they whiffed it too heavy there. This, this basically determines your value as a human being, your... Uh, the the honor of your ancestors as well as uh, de facto how good you are at video games and more <laughs> so lots of lots of uh lots of stuff is riding on this one and speaking of riding Rygan is riding into that pressure sequence nice jumpy air to air day is actually gonna steal that round away from Rygan my goodness Knowing where the gaps are, I think both players have played that air-to-air -air jumpy in a very interesting precarious position. There's probably some amount of uh, value for viewing this set previously and just looking at what the uh, what the players are doing. Nice, get the yoink out of the sky. No jump D for you, Mister. Nice again. Once again, the trade. Rygan doesn't need the clean hit, but even the trade leads into some pretty decent rewards. Speaking of rewards, we make those happen with a little bit of wild assault magic. Soft knockdown, though, is still anybody's game. May, or rather, Day, already has the 50 meter, gonna spend it into a dropped combo. That's tragic. And Rygan from what side? However, doesn't lead into a full combo day. Starting this sequence with 5B. Rygan with the burst. Rygan with the meter as well. Advantage. Rygan almost has 100. Day has 50. Yo! There's the 6P! The 6P! The one time Rygan doesn't swing that 6P very often. But oh boy, when he does, it's gonna hit and it's gonna take the round as well. 
Now Rygan is on set point here, potentially on the last corner pressure sequence. If we get to keep the prey here in the corner, nice jump out. Ooh, and the jump heavy on the way down as well. They maneuvering themselves very well as well. Oh, <laughs> I think Day's Dolphin was unleashed later here, so it was basically a better angle. Too early on the throw. Saving themselves with the use of the PRC, but now that PRC, that 50 meter, is not going to be available for your next conversion. I guess we don't need it, because we still have the 50. Raigan with the burst here, wants to take it right here, right now. It's a little bit of a precarious position. I mean, you, you kind of had to do it, because you were going to lose out of this game. So, you know, make it count, do what you can. Jump too heavy, oh my god, has to burst here. Save themselves, one more. Are we gonna do it? Is they hungry? Who's hungrier? Able to dodge with the jump D, the Orca mix up. Who's gonna flinch? Rygan goes for a raw wild assault and there it is. What better way to finish it than go for a jump D. You, sir, I see your jump D over there. Let me do a jump D of my own. This is a forward moving hitbox. And Rygan times it perfectly. Clearing this matchup. 7 to 3. And. You know? I don't want to be. <laughs> I don't want to be any sort of uh, authority between the knocking order of May players, but. I guess there's a, there are some things to be said when, you know, when you win 7 3. But a really good set here. Really happy to see Day on Bounty Hunters for the first time. Hope to see Day here in the future as well, perhaps on a more diverse matchup. But for today, we're moving on into the last matchup of the evening. So I think there was a, a request to switch one of the names. So this is a premeditated matchup. These. These guys wanted to play against each other, and they picked specific names to be displayed. So we have Nana Komatsu and Nana Osaki going against each other here. <laughs> Who are these mysterious people? Nobody knows. But you can be sure that this na last matchup is gonna be nothing short of sparks and fire. High level Zato. I think this is the highest level Johnny match on Bounty Hunters as well that we're gonna be seeing here. In terms of the character matchup, uh, don't ask me, beats me. We haven't seen Zato players for a very long time. During the era of uh, Johnny's. Uh, here's the tricky part. How am I going to differentiate between these players? We have Nana versus Nana. So instead of reflecting on themselves, let's do let's do a little bit of a Japanese weeby thing and use Komatsu Nana and Osaki Nana. Wait, this is so difficult. I'm gonna mix myself up here. What if we just say Zato and Johnny? <laughs> is that gonna be okay? Is that legal? Can I really do that? Can I be such a... Such a scumbag? Right, I'm super interested to see how this matchup is played. Nice reaction there. Johnny saw... The flinch there on on the puppet pressure tried to get an in with a instant air dash and i think johnny doesn't have the fastest instant air dash either if we go by what he had in the past Ooh, accidental 
uh, switch out of the corner. Here we go, reversal by Ozaki Nana is gonna deal damage. He's gonna actually deal a lot of damage. Enough to knock our Zero Guts uh, friend Zato here out of the set. Or rather, the round, in, in fact. Quite deal. Johnny's the kind of character that would love to get a couple of bluffs in. It really fits his, uh, his gambler type of uh, lore. So if, during a pressure string, you can manage to sneak in a deal, and then strike the opponent before they move out or press a button. That's a massive, massive value for you. Generally, you're gonna use your 50 meter for those, like guaranteed trade, uh, guaranteed deals into mist fighters, so that you can start your guard crush offense. Speaking of starting offense here, Komatsunana unfortunately missing the puppet gauge. Ah, but that's nice then, a little guy, the little guy. But we're still going, one more hit, anything is fine. Anti-air is okay, 5p, 5p. Osaki Nana jumping in with an FD. And here comes Zato, empty low. And since Puppet was ready to go, that was gonna be a lot of nasty mix-ups that you still had to block there. 2S. Definitely one of the round starts of all time. One of the few buttons that reach round start even against backwalking opponents and because it's a low you can do the math nice 6p there interrupting the pressure speaking of interrupts why is he to basically prevent the puppet sandwich from happening we got the little guy ready to go though overhead into another one into a low wow Osaki Nana perfect blocks there and breaks the that's so smart before he even gets the uh, gets the puppet back on, jump out of the corner, command grab. That's literally, I think, Osaki Nana has read every single freaking mix up right there. That was sequence of like what five, six different reads or something. Guessing right on every single one, and then the decisive one at the end there. Guessing on the command grab, which is gonna be punishable if you don't have your puppet ready to go. Usually the case is where you go for the command grab and if they jump you pull them back to the ground with the use of your puppet But if you don't have it, it's just straight up heart rate Speaking of heart rate casually takes the burst there get the wall as well now the difficult part here is that we don't have the puppet ready to go so we're gonna have to use this 50 meter to stall or just I mean get the hit RC and take the round that works as well why do something diff uh, difficult when you can do something simple? Then again, com combos from those uh, two P's or five P's are not the most simple thing in the in the game for uh, Zato for sure. Here we go, getting the summon out of that wild assault code blue. Osaki Nana has been so good so far at. Uh, Getting like an. Uh, finding their opportunities to poke at Zato at any point necessary. It's kind of like you don't really have to land anything on Zato on, on hit. It's completely fine that you make Zato block something and it's gonna erase the puppet. It's back dashing out of the Mist Finder range. Wires C. Understandable. They didn't wanna take the guard crush, which is where the nasty stuff starts happening for Johnny. But doing that, Nana Osaki was actually reading that. I guess it's the same kind of same kind of thing with both of these characters. When they get their like <laughs> when they get their victory conditions going, so like turning up the card for Johnny or uh Unleashing your pressure sequence with your puppet in tandem. Both of those times you would really love to use YRC before it gets out of control, right? So as a result, both of these characters are probably gonna be baiting those situations uh, in mind specifically. Ooh, dive on wait, did the deflect shield completely whiff on the break the law? 
Too bad though, because <laughs> the, the blue burst, you won't be able to escape the opponent's blue burst anymore, even if you go underground and with the 6k. Very telegraphed overhead compared to the 5d. But we're 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 making it count. We're making uh, we're making a good use of it. All right, trade on the trunk card shade. And a good 6p anti-air. Okay, the 6p like that. A lot of the anti-airs just don't lead into much for Zato unless you have your puppet ready to go, or unless it's a counter hit too heavy. But I mean, for a character like this, getting a heart knockdown is basically all the reward that you're gonna need. Because if you have your puppet ready to go, you're ready to unleash some nasty ass pressure. If your opponent doesn't have 50 meter for YRC or bursts ready to go, they're usually not gonna survive the onslaught of your puppet mix ups, right? Case in point here. Yep. <laughs> Eventually they will all yield. Sun Void is available. We're actually not gonna go into the Sun Void, we'll just get the Heart Knockdown here. I mean, we still have the opportunity to go for a Sun Void. Yeah, it goes for it immediately. Blue Burst. Last opportunity to unleash it. Komatsunana playing surprisingly good footsies there. I would have... I would have, like... So when I think about this matchup before seeing any of it being played, you would have to think that... Johnny has the decisive advantage at, you know, neutral. Especially if the puppet gauge is not ready to go yet. But surprisingly, Kobatsunara has just found really good footsie options. Kind of like waiting for the opportunity for Osaki Nana to, uh, you know, overextend, I guess it's is the word that I'm looking for. Should be actually add the character tags to their names. I think this might be in order. So now you can see that Komatsunana is the Zato player and Osaki Nana is the Johnny player. I think this is pretty good. Pretty good. I get the jump in. We still need to waste a little bit of time before Puppet is ready to be summoned. Wait, so Oh, I think, I think the 6P made the horizontal mistfinder actually whip there. But it's too bad, because like, you, often when you go for a 6P, you're looking for getting a hit on Johnny preferably, because if it whips, you're probably not going to be very plus, right? I'm not actually sure, but, you know. I guess the non-horizontal nature of Zato's 6P doesn't really favor him in this matchup when, you know, when you're trying to counterplay and go under k Mist Finer. Alright, got the puppet, got the main body itself as well. Nice air to a jump K into a full sequence. Are we gonna have a wall break? Yes, indeed, with a hard kind. And let's see it into the safe jump. Ooh, 5pp, very brave here. Even before the resources were, uh, were available. And Komatsunana doing a little bit of a <laughs> highway robbery here. Out of uh, what seemed to be a safe-ish setup. But I mean, eventually you're, like, when you're playing Johnny, and if you don't have a turn-up available already, speaking of turn-ups, turning this bitch up right now. With the float, gets in close and personal, but you can only do so much without your without your little guy. That should be a kill. Yes, indeed. Slice, dice. It's gonna be two games each here. Uh, another identical starter. I think we've started every single all, all of the seven matchups tonight with a uh, two-two. Which is where it started deviating for some of these sets. Gold burst, all right. Mr. 5K. Masaki Nana commi uh, committed to that very deep air dash over over Zato. Oh, I think wasn't able to trigger the turn up there, so no continuation to the combo. There we go. Both players dashing forward. However, when it's a dashing dashing forward versus dashing forward, and Johnny is. Uh, 
you know, concerned. Johnny is always at a disadvantage because Johnny does not have an uh, access to dash blocking. Johnny will in fact have to go through all of his recovery before FD becomes available or before holding back overall becomes available. Turn up. Yeah, just being swallowed by the pose. But the problem here is if you summon a little guy for playing neutral, that means that you're often not going to have him when you actually get there. But hopefully for those cases, you have 50 meter ready to go so you can go for a Sunpoint and just completely repress the gauge. Or then you're just cracked as fuck and play unsummon perfectly so that you never lose your full gauge. Ow! Right, the court card has been dealt, but even if you can't trigger the turn up, the mist finder range is still kind of nutty. Ooh, tried to throw there a little prematurely, and now you're getting mauled by Mr. Sponty himself. Find the low, not quite gonna kill yet. Back to neutral, Osaki Nana though with a very massive life advantage, and here come the mist fighters, even the up fighter. Triggers turn up, triggers guard crash, and yeah, it's, that's uh, it's a situation where you're just kind of hold, have to hold it, as we say in the industry. Hold it and just hold it, and then you guess. It's basically, I mean, Johnny's victory condition is fairly strong. I think it's like Johnny's downsides or Johnny's um, disadvantages as far as the character design goes, comes from the fact that you kind of have to work to get into that guard crush loop. But then when you get there, it's 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 kind of nutty and kind of nasty. Kind of like Zato here. Right, that's going to buy a lot of time. Nice evades the 2S and into the summon. Jump B, get out of there! But why is he just in the nick of time before Komatsunana has an opportunity to unsummon? Hit by the peers. Stay tight here. What a defense! Oh my god! If if I didn't know any better, and I mean I, I don't, but holy fuck! Ozaki Nana must be a Sando player as well. They just blocking everything right. This block of uh, efficiency, like accuracy for blocking the mix-ups, is way, way something like three out of four at this point for for our Johnny player. Which is kind of not what you want to see as Sato. When you finally get an opportunity to mix them up with Puppet, it's it's got to hit, right? It's, it's just got to hit. Nice. The Oppose actually taking the strike there from Osaki Nana. And then the counter ball coming in the form of Jump P from Komatsu Nana. What? The two... The Hitbox? Hello? Mr. Spondy, are you okay? Red Wild Assault is surely gonna go into the wall break. Do you need to use the other bar of the Wild Assault instead of the meter here? Now getting met by the 5 PPP mash RC into conversion. Still a couple of mixes ready to go. YRC. Oh, that was, that was blocked and punished. Are you freaking kidding me? You can punish like that? So it's like that, huh? Oh my god! Right, the Mist Finder once again, being the horizontal full screen sweeper that ends all and every every pet play. Pet, pet, uh, <laughs> that sounds kind of lewd. At right, 6B, very nice. You have to be kind of preemptive there if, uh, if Johnny wants to go for uh, the vault into deal. Especially if they're, spe they're planning on spending 50 meter there. Nice. Are we gonna switch sides? Yes, indeed. Are we gonna go into a wall break? No, just stealing into turn up. Yep, this is uh, almost better than what you could have gotten. But not getting enough resources to finish the plate here. It was like a hair button. No. But was able to cleave the puppet out of the round. This is now very tough for Komatsunana. Into the guard break as well. Yeah, big close slash. You're basically in that situation. You're guessing for strike throw. 
And that time, I mean, many times, it tends to be the strike. But the nasty thing is, if you take the if you take the throw option, then you're just gonna re repeat the same situation again. It's gonna be deal into a guard crush all over again. There's nothing you can do about it. So it's not like you want to take the throws for free either. Speaking of taking the throws, maybe you should have considered that. Looking at the damage that's being mounted here by Osaki Nana. Lots of uh, resources to defend with, though. But how do you defend against these nasty mix-up? Hello? Are we gonna burst? YRC is the first defensive option unleashed here. There is still opportunity to come back. I mean, every time you have a puppet ready to go and you can pressure your opponent there. Yo! Look at that! That, <laughs> that shimmy! Wasn't the most damaging shimmy in the world, but I mean, a successful shimmy is a shimmy. Use the blue colored wild assault. There we go, we got there. Now ready to summon again. We even have an extra wild assault if we want to use it, but rather save it for the next round. I mean, if, if Komatsu Nana just wanted to home in on taking that round, they could have used definitely used another uh, stack of blue wild assault and guarantee, basically full guarantee that the summon comes online. But I mean, starting this round with a wild assault available is kind of kind of cool as well and kind of kind of ebby, kind of pog. Don't strike into this. I love that. Choosing to hold on to that Mistfinder while Oppose is active, because you can't hold the Oppose active forever either. You're like the when it's when it's when it's there, it's gonna draw from your minion gauge. IRC once again, no one summon available. We do have an option to go for Sun Void here, or just to break the wall. We choose the Sun Void. We're choosing violence. And now, is it gonna be enough? Another Sun Void? Yeah, that's the safe play. Of course, Amorphous is gonna deal a little bit, of, a little bit of extra damage compared to the Sun Void, but you know, having your puppet is always the safer play. His final reach is far and wide. What's this gonna be? Look at that, the scoop and fakes! Oh my goodness! We have the card there down low, but we're not gonna use any of it. We're just gonna go into the throw. Why is the 5D this time instead of the 6K? We were using the 6K for a slow overhead at the start of the round, but now leaning on the good old 5D tap dust. 25 frames, or is it 20? Sorry, 21 frames. 20 or 21, either one of those. Don't quote me. YRC, get off me. No red wild assault pressure for you, sir. Into sandwich. And refresh the gauge. Get, get, gauge. Get, 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 gauge. Ooh. Again, Osaki Nana's defense is so good. It's like blocking the initial mix-ups and then going for going for the YRCs and the bursts when there's just kind of... Even, even if Komatsu Nana baits it, there's just not a whole lot of rewards that they can get out of it. It's... It, it just seems like ultimate... Counter Zato play. There is no hesitation. This man has played against Zato before. I would argue this man has probably played Zato before. So what will be that adjustment for Komatsunana then? Certainly not getting your puppet cleaved by the Red Wild Assault. I mean, Osaki Nana using all of their burst resource, but you're probably happily do this. Got tagged out of the mini sequence though. Well, slash, yep. Turn up is gonna increase the damage a little. YRC, that was super smart. So if you get guard broken, you actually lose your ability to use any of your uh, defensive options, so you can't YRC anymore. So it's like, if you wanna YRC against those turn ups, you gotta YRC before they go active. So both players, this is probably one of the best showcases of all of the show matches that I've ever casted for how to utilize your universal resources, universal defensive resources for uh, for a particular matchup. Very nice throw. We're gonna have to wait for extra four seconds. We're gonna get the wall break here, but like I said, extra four, perhaps even five before we can summon again. Yeah, and Osaki Nana is not gonna wait around the deal 
the card actually gets absorbed by the the drill. Nice pick up again from that jump gay and safe jump. Yeah, try to go for the uh, the throw variant. So even when you don't have a card dealt on the ground, you can still play uh, you can still play strike throw. The strike option is to let go of your uh, to let go of your mistfinder stance. And then the throw option is you're gonna miss finer stance towards them, let it go and throw, and you're you, you really won't be able to see it. The the strike is usually accompanied by the back miss finer instead, which is another case of you know you can't react if Nago is doing forward fukio or back fukio, which is kind of like the backbone of his mix-up game, or one of the backbones of of the uh, the mix-up games. Anyway. Red Wild Assault Raw once again, pounces forward, this time missing. Another deal. Forcing Komatsunana towards the other corner, the D, the, 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 the turn ups, keep stacking. And Komatsunana can't really like move forward in from that position very safely because like if you if you walk forward, if you dash forward, if you press a button, that turn up is gonna trigger on you and you're gonna be popped up in the air. Speaking of being popped, go again. Where's the counterplay? What can we do here? Soft knockdown, we still have some play. But look at this. Throw the card. You know they're not gonna wanna engage with it. Push forward. Doing the Mistfinder stance, you can take those uh, those special little command dashes forward before unleashing your Mistfinder. That's a very tricky situation. Osaki Nana. In six point position, it's like not not like the Zato player has uh, not like Komatsunana has you know not played very well either, but like look at this. Look at this shit! Look at this! This is Johnny! It's one of the best Johnny plays that I've seen in my life, period, or rather in Guilty Gear Strive. I mean, of course I've seen a lot of Johnny plays in my time being an XX and Exert player. <clears throat> anyway, there we go. The 2S goes active before the forward dash out of the Mistfinder stance goes active. Do we have the kill? Not quite. Looking for one more hit. What's it gonna be? Drift forward. Strike throw. Are we a strike throw character? Hello? Any strike throwers in the chat? No! Not able to finish it, but 5B comes clutch the fast anti air against that instant air dash. We're still in it. Hopefully to win it as well. But it's gonna be a long rocky road, there we go. Mounts the defensive shield in front. The oppose. Ah, unlucky trade there. By the tap, not gonna be very plus. In fact, plus minus zero. Actually, I think Komatsunara was thinking about the YRC there, but since there was a gap, turned out to be a blue RC. Nice side swap. Immediate burst from Osaki Nana. And what are we cooking? YRC just before the summon goes active again. Look at this! The universal resource, re resource usage! The usage of the YRC, perfect! Using it just before the summon goes active. You didn't really have to spend it before, right? Because you you can kind of, if you're patient, you can check whether you get out before the summon becomes available. And then spend the YRC when it's red alert, red alert, we need to do something. Yeah, it's gonna, that's gonna slice and dice. Zero guts, as we said earlier. Osaki Nana on first set point here. Is our Zato player gonna survive the fight another day? Find out in the next couple of minutes. Zato is ready to be summoned, or Eddie rather. I mean, technically Zato and Eddie are just lore-wise, they're just one, so... I'm not sure what, what to call the puppet anymore. I'm not sure what to think about Guilty Gear lore anymore. It's too much for me, Chief. It's too much. Finds the low. Into a conversion. We have a lot of resources here. Burst becomes available too late. Stripping Komatsunana out of the ability to use the burst. However, a little bit of hesitation there. Komatsunana on the warpath. The super is gonna hit the little guy, so won't be zero value, but certainly not a good place to be. Hard knockdown, and... 
Are we clapping? Deflect shield is not gonna do anything in that point. Good on Komatsunana playing that situation. Not really choosing to not engage any of those uh, defensive resources that uh, that Johnny had available there. Yo, we have the air throws. Old school. Nice spacing. Instead of uh, committing to the anti-air, just taking a step back and letting uh, Komatsunana land from the flight. Ooh. Into. Kill. Komatsunana has definitely been... Uh, I, I mean, both players have been really trigger-happy on the, on the throws here and there. So lots of big counter hits have been landed from those shimmy situations. Now, are we gonna get out of there? From the flight, approaches the big blade. And then the puppet. Ooh, got the puppet. So again, not not without value this sequence. Perfect spacing there just outside of Mistfinder range. However, here comes the Mistfinder man. Pop them up into the sky. Have the burst here. Otherwise, it's over. YRC. Please, no bursts. Shenanigans. Give me blue wars or give me red one wild, wild as well. 6p under. Oh, I guess you are plus there as the player who's 6p's. Perhaps? Are still a tight crest. Oh, it yo! <laughs> the classic! RC out of the break the law. If they didn't hit anything, just guess for the throw. Get a backdash or jump to get out. If they stroke, or if they st strike, stroked? If, if they had a stroke, then you get the throw. But YRC, get back into the corner. Is he still alive? Get the summon. Gonna make this count. Finally finding the low. Osaki Nana, it's been 10,000 years since our Johnny player has been opened up by a proper se uh, offense sequence. And what, a, what, what, what a better way to, you know, get it off than when you're just about get it, get, getting ready to be unlimited, uh, uh, un, 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 unlimited? Eliminated from the set. All right, time to take a quick little breather. This is getting out of hand. Four to six. <clears throat> Slowly starting to see the signs of life. Perhaps <clears throat> the Zato pros are struggling, but Komatsunana showing that we definitely have what it takes to come out of these competitive bouts victorious if you play well enough. But speaking of well enough, Osaki Nana playing this round kind of good. Now once again arriving to the set point, it's gonna have at least two set points for Komatsunana to clear before we get out of this jail. Slice them into the corner, throw the card up high, very smart. Ooh, but look at that, the double jump, or perhaps the super jump, jump K. Punching Komatsunana out of the flight. Not done yet, though. Although what is done is Komatsunana's puppet gauge. Hard knockdown, we gotta waste time. That's gonna waste four seconds. Couple more seconds before the puppet can be unleashed. Got the counter hit. And the cash out, that should be the kill. Alright, he's doing it. He's doing it. 5P round start. Why did that call out even? Again, the 5Ps. The very unassuming looking buttons that end up being one of the better buttons in Zato's kit when it comes to fighting outside of uh, having Popfight available. But it could be Komatsunana's last chance, last dance, burst becomes available, uses it immediately. Card is on the board. Oh, the 2k eliminates little guy. The instant overhead. DK, Mist Fighter, is it over? It's over. Pack it up, boys. Osaki Nana coming through with the victory. 7 to 4. But it was a very valiant run back. It was looking very tight. It was 6 2. In those situations, a lot of us, a lot of the players would fold, just crumble, cr get crushed under the competitive pressure, just give up and roll over. But not here. Getting a couple of points in there.
trying to mount a, mount a comeback, but, you know, too little, too late. We got pretty good swag moves from Osaki Nana overall. Probably the flashiest... Um, flashiest Johnny play I've seen on Bounty Hunters so far. Yeah, where are you at, Shady? Where are you at? I want to see that high-level Johnny. Huh? <laughs> Sign up, bro. Anyway, that'll be that for the matchups today. Was uh quite a quite a <laughs> quite a run again. Let's see if we have any Guild Gear streamers on the other side of the other side of the twitch.tv. But yeah, if you want to sign up for these events, we do this every Sunday. 5 p.m. CET. You may join my Discord. You may receive a trade offer. I give you uh, Google Docs to sign up. And you will receive a cool, even FT7 match, uh, FT7 match next Sunday. Yeah? Sounds good. No stripe seed with streamers? Uh, do we know any of these players? I mean, Izzy is streaming. Izzy's kinda cool, Tio. as well as plays on Bounty Hunters from time to time. So how about we go raid easy. Right, but this will be it for QK for this week. Thank you so much for watching once again. Thank you for all the players, everybody who was, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, <laughs> everybody who was uh, affiliated with the making of this event and these events overall. I love you all. See you next Sunday, 5 p.m. CET. More Guild Gear. Till then, stay safe. Let's get better at the video games. Bye-bye.